All right. Good evening, everyone. We're back in uh, public session. I apologize for the delay. Our private session ran uh, a little bit longer than we had anticipated. I apologize for that. Uh, I would like to uh, jump to a very uh, special announcement this evening, if I may. It is my pleasure this evening to congratulate the seven Westfield High School seniors who have been named finalists in the National Merit Scholarship Program. They represent the largest group of West in Westfield attaining this honor in more than a decade. Their extraordinary accomplishment is, an, is a tribute to Westfield High School, which is rooted in a tradition of academic excellence. These students have worked hard for this honor and we congratulate them and those who have supported their efforts throughout the years. According to the National Merit Scholarship Corporation, the nationwide pool of finalists represents approximately 1% of U.S. high school seniors. You are among the highest scoring entrants in the nation on the preliminary SAT National Merit Scholarship qualifying test. That includes your scores on all three testing areas, critical reading, mathematics, and writing. You are academic scholars and you have proven yourself on a national level. And we on the Westfield Board of Education applaud your hard work, your achievement, and commitments to your education, and we wish you continued success. As I call out your name, if you would please step up to the podium and receive a certificate of appreciation from the Westfield Board of Education. First, I have Jill Rosenfeld. Next is Mark Gillespie. And finally, Kristen Haig. Unfortunately, a few were unable to attend this evening due to previous commitments. And they are Alexander Beals, Rachel Holtzman, Lily Wang, and Alexandra Mossaware. We will send their certificates to Westfield High School. If we could just give a round of applause to all of our students for achieving this. Yeah, <laughs> they did not get that one wrong. That's a good day. All right, congratulations again. All right, other announcements. Brendan, anything down your end? Yes. Westfield Public Schools are celebrating nationally acclaimed Youth Art Month in March with colorful and creative displays throughout the downtown area. Paintings, drawings, sculpture, and painted furniture designed by approximately 270 students from Westfield's 10 public schools are displayed by 38 downtown merchants as well as the Westfield Memorial Library and RMC Studios in Garway. All volunteered their window or display space. Um, the Westfield High School's Wind Ensemble has been chosen as one of seven exceptional high school bands and orchestras nationwide to perform at Lincoln, Lincoln Center's Avery Fisher, Fisher Hall. 
I haven't been drinking, I promise. On March 23rd, as part of this year's National Band and Orchestra Festival. On, on Saturday, March 22nd, the 43-member Westfield High School Ensemble will travel to New York City to participate in a clinic and internationally with an internationally recognized composer. On Sunday, March 23rd, the Wind Ensemble will return to New York to perform a 25-minute musical program beginning at 145 in the prestigious Avery Fisher Hall. Westfield High School Director of Bands, Chris Vital, stated, the students in the Wind Ensemble have been working tirelessly through snow days, weekend rehearsals, sectionals, and private lessons in preparation for an opportunity to represent our school and our community at this legendary performance venue. Congratulations. Uh, this is from Athletics, uh, a, a bunch of different uh, announcements. Congratulations to the Westfield High School boys swim team for winning the state title on February 23rd. It marks the 25th state title with Westfield High School as the only school to win that many state titles in one sport. It's quite an accomplishment. Uh, next, during the recent meet of champions, Westfield High School swimmer Caroline Baldwin won and set a meet record for the 50-yard freestyle. In addition, in the 200-yard relay, another win and meet record was earned by Caroline Baldwin, Gwyn Devon, Erica Daniel, and Sarah Cronin. Caroline Baldwin also won the 100-yard backstroke. In wrestling, we congratulate Nick Vells, who are in the Region 3 Championship. Nick and teammates John Fuller and Matt Barber will advance to the Atlantic City uh, competition for individual state titles. We wish them good luck in this next phase of competition. And best of luck to our ice hockey team as it advances to the state semifinals. Hmm. Westfield High School senior Gabby Stravick won both the 1600 and 3200 at the North 2 Group 4 State Sectional Championships on Friday, February 8th. She's the first track and field athlete in the girls program to earn two titles in one meet. Her time in the 1600 was also a school record. Matt Lupino was also state sectional champion in the 1600 for the boys team. Also, we were recently made aware of a recognition made at the end of the fall sports season. Girls varsity soccer player Carly Satung was named Star Ledger Union County Player of the Year. In addition, the National Soccer Coaches Association of America named Carly All-Region and All-American. Congratulations to everybody on the uh, <coughs> great events. Um, this is from the Fine Arts Department. The Fine Arts Department of the Westfield Public Schools invites the public to attend any of the 40 musical events scheduled for this spring. Approximately 2,500 students in grades kindergarten through high school will be performing district-wide. All concerts are free. Concert dates, times, and school addresses are available on the district website. In addition, Roosevelt uh, Intermediate School, Westfield High School, and Edison Intermediate School will be performing musical theater. This weekend, Roosevelt performs 13 from Friday through Sunday. From March 13th through 15th, Westfield High School will present Anyone Can Whistle. And Edison Intermediate School's spring musical the Little Mermaid will be held March 27th through 29th. So come on out and see these great shows. Surely, I'd like to tell you about Alexandra Jackman. Alexandra is a freshman at Westfield High School. She came to the board meeting and showed us her uh, video about autism. She is a strong advocate for autism awareness, and she has been honored for exemplary volunteer service with the President's Volunteer Service Award on behalf of President Barack Obama. She has also been given a Certificate of Excellence from the Prudential Spirit of Community Awards Program. The letter from the White House closes with, thank you for your devotion to service and for doing all you can to shape a better tomorrow for our great nation. Separate and apart from these distinctions, Alex's video which is entitled, A Teen's Guide to Understanding and Communicating with People with <coughs> Autism, was chosen to be screened at the Palm Beach International Film Festival in the documentary category. The festival will take place April 3rd through the 10th. <coughs> we congratulate Alex on the admiration and the accolade she continues to receive for her autism awareness efforts. She is a wonderful example of the spirit of service and volunteerism and an amazing young lady with tremendous accomplishments as a high schooler. We look forward to wonderful, wonderful things in her life. 
Absolutely. A couple other things from the high school. Congratulations to Fraser uh, Wiest, if I'm getting that right, and Nicole Devitt, who are seniors at the high school, who are among 3,000 12th graders from throughout the country selected by the federal government as candidates for the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program. Fraser is also is a candidate as a U.S. Presidential Scholar in the Arts. No other high school senior in the country has the distinction of being nominated in two categories in this prestigious program. Both Fraser and Nicole earn perfect scores in every subject of area of the S ACT, of course, a standardized test used for college admission criteria. In addition, Fraser, who is a prolific music composer, won six Grammys. No, he, 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 will, he will. He will. He will. We know it'll happen. Might as well get it out there now. Um, was chosen and has attended the National Young Arts Week in Florida earlier this year. Quite, quite, quite amazing. And congratulations to four more Westfield High School 11th graders who have achieved perfect scores in the December SAT and ACT standardized tests. They include Jacqueline Napolitano in science, Brian Johnson, science and math, Catherine Coe, SAT writing, and Nina Wang, SAT writing and reading and writing. This group of students brings to, the ni to 19 the total of perfect SAT or ACT scores so far in this school year in Westfield. But we have more dates coming. So. Wow. Wow. I have two announcements from Roosevelt Intermediate School. Eighth graders from Roosevelt Intermediate School in Westfield and Cedar Brook School in Plainfield discuss elements of the Steinbeck novel of Mice and Men in the Roosevelt Cafeteria on February 21st. This marked the third year of the successful exchange program. The students from each school first became acquainted with one another when studying the novel of Mice and Men for four weeks, which included two visits between the schools to share ideas. Roosevelt also established an online wiki for students from both schools to communicate between meetings and discuss multiple analytical questions about the text. This past weekend, they wrapped up this year's exchange program at a dance hosted by the Plainfield School. Approximately 30 students from each school attended with chaperones from both Westfield and Plainfield. Roosevelt's assistant principal, Brian Getchman, said, the dance, which included a DJ and refreshments, was a great success. And the second announcement from Roosevelt um, is that Roosevelt ended the month of February by celebrating Black History Month with its seventh annual visit by the Newark Boys Chorus. Roosevelt's Sharps and Flats singers joined the chorus in musical selections. The keynote speaker of the morning's assembly was Sharon Robinson, daughter of baseball legend Jackie Robinson, who broke the race barrier in 1947 by becoming the first African-American major league baseball player. A key leader in the organization called Breaking Barriers for Sports and Life, Sharon Robinson, who holds several academic degrees and has, a multi has had a multifaceted career, currently works to raise awareness of her father's nine values to live by. Courage, determination, teamwork, persistence, integrity, citizenship, justice, commitment, and equality. Thank you. All right. The next Board of Education meeting will be held on Tuesday, March 25th at 7.30 p.m. here at 302 Elm Street. We will continue our 2014-2015 budget discussions at that meeting. With that, I would recognize the public for agenda items only. Uh, can you come to the podium? Oh, yeah. Did you I just add it on right now? I'm sorry? Oh, that's oh right. sure. Sure, you can wait for that. Yeah. All right, that's all I want to do. That's Thank you. Anyone else? All right. And with that, seeing no one come to the podium, we will go to the superintendent's report. All right, thank you. And um, as we just stated, the superintendent's report for this evening does have to do with the proposed budget for next year. Um, but before we begin that, I want to take one step back. Um, in order to even begin to put such a budget together, 
one of the first things we have to do um, is to project enrollment for next year because the vast, vast, vast majority of our budget is built on exactly what the needs are for students at different ages and the numbers of students. So um, I had reviewed in detail with the uh, Long Range Planning Committee the projections for enrollment for next year and we'll just go over very briefly right now before introducing the budget presentation. So um, briefly just to look at uh, general areas at our um, um, early childhood and elementary level, our projections for next year for enrollment, they are pretty much the same overall. We, will, uh, we have a pretty much the same uh, enrollment there, and so we'll need pretty much the same staffing for next year, not major changes there. Um, um, two things I just want to um, alert the board about. One is it looks as though we may require an additional um, morning or afternoon section of kindergarten because our numbers seem to be up at the kindergarten level, so we'll probably be able to do that. Um, and that's accounted for in the budget. Um, and we have one other problem that's not as much a budget problem. We have one first grade, um, that would be the first grade in Jefferson, where right now we are almost at the maximum. And between now, uh, which is only March, and September, that's a long time, and we often have many first graders moving into the district or registering late. Um, so I may very well be coming back to the board asking for permission, uh, even if someone lives in the Jefferson neighborhood, um, we may need to ask those children to go to a different school for first grade because we are just just about at the point where there's no more room. So I just want to make you alert to that, and I will come back to the board um, when um, I see that is really vital to do that. So it's a good problem to have too many children. Um, hopefully the other first graders will move into our other schools. We're still fine. <laughs> so uh, that would be my hope, that our other first graders move into the right places. But at the elementary level, other than that, in early childhood, we're, we should be in good shape and not much, not much change for next year. The intermediate level, um, we actually, next year, we will have a bit of a decrease. Um, next year is the year where we knew we were having uh, an evening, more of an evening off of enrollment. So our sixth graders, for example, will be able to go back to um, the regular districting that the school district has had. Um, and since the overall numbers across the sixth grade are lower than the eighth grade that's leaving, you'll see in the budget presentation we have a few fewer teachers. Uh, because we have some fewer students at that level. At the high school level, as we've been projecting, we do have some increase next year at the high school level, but as we projected based on figures for the, over the last four or five years, we are anticipating that the high school will have a total of 32 more children next year, which requires overall over the total four years, which requires some additional staffing, but it is not a huge increase. Um, and you will see that accounted for in this budget as well, that we require some additional staffing at the high school, um, but um, not an overwhelming number. So those are overall um, parameters of the enrollment, which certainly impact the budget. Having said that, I think I'll now turn this over to our business administrator, Dana Sullivan, who will present the various aspects of the budget process and the budget itself. Thank you. So the budget really starts um, in the fall, early in the fall, and it's a process that takes us all the way through the spring. Um, so the start of the budget is the development of the goals and the priorities for the district, uh, because that is what's going to drive our budget development for the following year. Um, the administration does prepare the budget. It is presented to the Finance Committee for review first um, in detail, and they make recommendations to the full board. Um, and then the board is developed and approved in accordance with a calendar that is um, mandated by the state of New Jersey. So to start with the board goals, um, the board goals for the district this year were to implement the Marshall teacher evaluation model effectively, to develop and use benchmark assessments to measure student growth, and to implement new digital tools and media to improve communication between the district and all of its stakeholders. Um, so that, that starts by story development of our priorities for the year. Um, the priorities that are in, funded in this budget are academic support um, for all students, the continuation of our literacy initiative, um, technology we're going to talk about more later on, but technology has been a priority for several years. Um, recently the state has imposed requirements um, known as park requirements, um, the definition is there. Um, this is also related to technology and there is funding in the budget to, to meet these requirements. Um, our facilities, maintenance of our facilities is a priority and, and has been. Uh, we do have old school buildings so we continue to need um, to take care of those buildings and, and maintain them. 
um, professional development for all of our staff and security for our students and staff uh, remains a priority. So the administration also has to look at the needs of the district um, and the mandates for the district. Dr. Dolan spoke about enrollment projections and the fact that 80% of our budget is staff and benefits, therefore that is the first place that we look is what is our enrollment projection, what are our staffing needs for the following year, and that's how we um, begin the, the development of our budget. Um, curriculum mandates from the state, <coughs> and implementation of those curriculum um, also. Um, we do have mandates in, in many areas. Um, just to highlight a few, special education is an area which is highly regulated um, by law. Um, and transportation is another example, and there are many, many mandates, um, which I'm sure we could all name a, a list of them here. Um, we do have contractual ob obligations that we must finance in, in our budget. Um, health and safety is mostly related to our facility issues and uh, building maintenance. So we start out with building the expenditure side of the budget first. Um, each school is given an allocation based on the number of pupils in their school for supplies, materials, and textbooks. Um, and that's done to, in order to keep an equitable balance between each school. And it is, there is a difference between middle school, elementary, and, and high school um, because of the needs that they have. Uh, each department, so that's special ed, human resources, et cetera, develops a budget. Um, based on the mandates that they have in their department and the needs they have. The superintendent and I review each school and each department budget with the principal or the appropriate head of that department. Um, while we're doing all this and, and looking at our staffing needs for the following year, we do try to implement savings whenever possible, try to do something differently if we can, um, and we talk a little later on about some of the things that we have done to save money in the upcoming budget. After the expenditure side of the budget is um, prepared, we prepare the revenue side. Um, we are mandated by the state of New Jersey to have a balanced budget, <coughs> so revenues must equal expenditures. The revenue side is always the difficult part because of the timing of the information that we receive from the state. So we did just receive state aid information last Thursday. Um, the, and I'll talk more in detail about state aid. We then determine how much of the fund balance that we have are we going to use for tax relief um, for the following year. We have other areas of income which are minor um, in relation to the total budget, but they are tuition that we receive on, um, obviously, our money that's in the bank. Um, we have building rental income and some tuition income for a couple of students that attend our schools in special ed programs. Um, those are all very minor areas of the budget. Um, and then finally, we determine what is the tax levy that is required to support the proposed budget. So all of that information is built into the entire district budget. Um, we then determine on from that budget, where are we in relation to the state cap? So the state has a 2% a limit of 2% on the increase in the operating budget tax levy. Um, and then I'll get into more detail about that. But what we do is look at the budget, look at the revenue side, and say, where are our relation to cap? Are we below, at, or above? Um, if we are above, the superintendent and I would recommend to the finance committee and to the board um, whether we can exceed that cap with adjustments that we're allowed to use from the state or should we make recommendations in order to bring that budget to the 2% cap? The review of the budget, I, I mentioned earlier, the budget presented to the Finance Committee um, for their review and comments. The budget's been presented to the full board and the community, which obviously we're doing <coughs> this evening. Um, the board will approve a tentative budget that is submitted to the Union County Executive Superintendent for her review. Um, she will review and authorize us to advertise that budget, and we are required to advertise that budget. Um, the board will discuss this budget and present it at several board meetings. Um, within the state timelines, you will hold a public hearing on the budget, and then you will adopt the final budget. So although you will adopt a tentative budget, um, from the tentative budget to the final budget, you are allowed to make changes within that budget. Um, you will not be able to increase the budget, though. <coughs> 
So the budget highlights for the 2014-15 proposed budget. Um, we are continuing funding for our literacy initiative. We are continuing funding for our technology initiative. There is sufficient funding in here to meet our park requirements for next year. Um, we will continue to fund our STEM program. Funding is continued for mandated programs and academic support. Um, this budget does maintain all of our existing class size um, guidelines. It maintains all of our co-curricular athletic and fine arts programs. Um, we have provided resources for the high school enrollment increases. Um, we will continue to maintain our facilities. The tax levy increase is at the state adjusted cap, and again, we'll talk more about that. And this budget reflects a total increase in state aid of $66,677, and that's made up of an increase in our basic state aid for the operating budget of $124,000. Um, however, we did receive a decrease in our debt service aid, um, and that's a $57,323,000 decrease. Now to get into the specifics of the budget. Um, this is the revenue side of our budget. Um, and just to walk you through 13-14 first, if you look at the first line there is local tax levy. So for the 13-14 budget, we started with $86.3 million tax levy. Our state aid was $3.8 million. Um, special Ed Medicaid initiative is revenue that we receive <coughs> from Medicaid um, for services that are provided to students that are eligible for Medicaid. Um, <clears throat> fund balance is the amount of fund balance that we take, so that's the amount of our surplus that we can use as a revenue, and that also will then enable us to reduce our tax levy. Um, and then we have other revenue, as I mentioned earlier, interest and some building rentals. So the total operating budget of $92.0 million is the budget that was approved last year as your original 13-14 budget. What happens is as we then start the fiscal year in July, we have purchase orders that are open when we, as, as of the end of the year before. Those purchase orders roll into the 13-14 budget and increase both sides of the budget. So you will see an increase here of, in revenue of a million one for those purchase orders and there's also a corresponding increase in the expenditure side of the budget for those purchase orders <clears throat> maintenance reserve we as you know we have a balance in our maintenance reserve account that we use to fund certain projects um, for the facilities and we are allowed to transfer that money out of that reserve and into the operating budget to get, do some work um, which we did last summer um, but that also will increase the operating budget from the original adopted budget. So that's why that number is there to re reflect it in the revenue in 1314. Your total ad adjusted operating budget in 1314 was $93.1 million. Special revenue is a separate fund, and that's where all of our federal, local, and state grants are accounted for. Um, so these are grants that are given to us for a specific purpose, um, and we don't budget for those until we receive notification from whether it's federal, state, or local um, that we are receiving the grant. Um, and as I said, they're designated for a specific purpose, purpose and are accounted for in a separate fund, um, as we're required to do. And then we have our debt service fund, which is where we account for our payments on bonds that have been issued by the school district. So this is paying our interest um, and principal on the um, bonds that have been sold and we do get some state aid on this for this, and then the rest is supported by local tax levy. So with all of those adjustments in the 13-14 budget, our total budget is $98.6 million. Moving into 14-15, the proposed budget is reflecting a local tax levy in the operating budget of $88.9 million, which is a 3.02% increase. Um, our state aid has increased by $124,000, um, and that's, as I mentioned, from notification of the state that we received last week. Um, we are required to budget a certain amount of the, from the special ed Medicaid initiative aid. The state actually tells us what we have to budget there, and that's what's reflected there, the $24,744. Uh, we are maintaining the revenue from our fund balance at the million four fifty six, as we have in, in the past several years. And um, we do see a small decrease in other revenue there, and that's because of um, a tuition student who is no longer in the district. 
So our total operating budget for 2014-15 is $94.7 million. You, will, you won't see at this point an adjustment there for prior year POs or maintenance reserve funds used because that won't occur until July um, of this when we get into the next uh, fiscal year. The special revenue fund shows a decrease there, and the reason that that shows a decrease is because we simply cannot budget for grants that we haven't received official notification that we're going to receive. Um, so that will increase as we go through the year next year and grants are awarded to us. Um, but at this point, the million six is really just for the IDEA and NCLB, which are grants that we know we'll, we'll be entitled to receive. Um, the local debt service, Again, it is for repayment of the, the bonds that are sold, and that's a fixed amount that we know how much our, our debt is. So the total budget for next year is proposed at $99.5 million. So if we take the tax levy, and, and I said earlier, the 2% the cap is on the tax levy. It's not on the expenditure side of the budget. It's on the operating tax levy. So the tax levy for 13-14 was $86.3 million. The amount that we would be able to increase that and stay within the 2% cap was $1.7 million. We are allowed to adjust that for increases in our health insurance costs um, that exceed 2%. So for four, in the 14-15 budget, we did generate an assessment, an adjustment, I'm sorry, of $400,149, um, which we are recommending that we use in this budget. Um, and then we have adjustments from 2011-12 and 2013-14 that we are able to use and we are recommending that we do use those in the 14-15 um, budget. We did not have an adjustment banked for the 12-13 year, which is why you don't see an adjustment there. Um, so our total allowable adjustments to the cap is $879,443. Um, which brings our total proposed tax levy to $88.9 million, which reflects a 3.02% increase. Um, because we are recommending using the current year adjustment and the, the past year adjustments, there would be no cap, no adjust cap, I'm sorry, adjustment carried forward to the following year. So next year, the only adjustment available to us would be if we generate some adjustment in the 15-16 budget. <coughs> the impact of that on the tax rate and to a homeowner. And this is just school taxes. Um, there are municipal taxes, yes. of course, and county taxes as well. So for 13-14, um, the operating budget tax rate was 4.647. Debt service was 0.138 for a total school rate tax rate of 4.785. Um, and to an average homeowner, that would represent a tax, a school tax of $8,642. For next year, with the increases proposed, that the operating budget would increase to 4.812 tax rate. The <coughs> debt service would be 0.154 for a total school tax rate of 4.966, um, and the average homeowner would pay 89.32. So the Increase dollar increase to an average homeowner would be $290 next year. Um, 205 of that would be attributable to the 2% increase and the increase in the debt service. Um, the 85, 85 of that 290 is attributable to the cap adjustments that we are recommending we use. So to look at a breakdown of the state aid, um, these are the different areas of state aid that we receive. The first three areas, as you can see, stayed flat, the same dollar amount as last year. Um, the state added two new areas of aid, one called park readiness aid and one called per pupil growth aid. Um, and although they are given to us and called park readiness aid, um, we are able to use them in any way that we, they're, they're undesignated funds. So we don't have to use them for park readiness, although we do have money in the budget for that. Um, but these are undesignated um, or basic state aid as they term it. Um, we are also budgeting a million dollars in extraordinary special education aid. This is the one aid that we don't know how much we're going to receive yet for next year. In fact, we don't even know yet how much we're going to receive for this current year. Um, there has been an increase per the 
the governor's budget message in the extraordinary special ed aid, so we are hoping to, to receive more than we anticipate. Um, but since this is never a, a sure number, um, we need to budget this conservatively. Um, and this is based on an application that we submit and, and extraordinary costs mm -hmm. for students that are in and out of district receiving special ed um, services. So the total operating budget state aid uh, has increased, as I said, $124,000. Debt service aid did go down 57323 So overall, our state aid went up $66,000. Um, this slide is without debt service, showing the state aid as a percent of the total budget. Um, you know, we are, we're happy to be back at the a little less than 4% level, um, considering 2010, 2011, you can see we took a drastic reduction in state aid um, and made you know, many reductions in the budget that year. Um, so we're happy to be back at the 4% level, but you can tell that in prior years it was up um, over 8%, which was certainly uh, more beneficial to the taxpayers. And our cost to pupil, this is data that is prepared by the state of New Jersey, um, the Department of Education. And what they do is take audited um, financial statements from every school district and calculate what they call a comparable cost per district. So they do take some costs out of this um, calculation, such as out of district tuition and transportation, because um, they really can't, you can't compare from one district to the other those costs because of the needs of the students. Um, so you can see by this chart, and there's, it's, there's, they calculate it for different size districts. Um, for districts that are K-12, over 3,500 students, the state average is 13738 per student, and we spend uh, $12,133. Um, this data is from 2011-12. This is the most recent data that we do have available from the state, uh, which is why we're using this data. Um, and you can see that other districts that are similar to us, um, many of them spend more than we do per student. Mm -hmm. um, this slide, I, I could have just referred to the announcements tonight instead of putting this slide in here. Um, our, <laughs> the fact that we don't spend a lot of money per student compared to other districts, we're certainly doing a great job with our students. Um, and here's some of our accomplishments, but as I said, I think our announcements uh, were even more impressive. The allocations of the budget. Um, so we are mandated by state law to break our budget out into certain categories and to um, in certain accounts and to, to budget that way. So I know some people find it confusing sometimes the way we do um, present our budget in the accounts that we do, but we are mandated by law to do that. Um, so 61.6% of our budget goes towards direct instruction. Um, 2.7% of our budget is for transportation costs. Um, building administration represents 4.4%, and that is principals, secretaries, and all the costs associated um, with running the school offices. Um, we do 8.4% of our budget is for student support, so that's child study teams, costs, related services, and extraordinary services for students. Um, 4.8% percent of our budget is for support, support services, which includes tech, tech expenses, central administration, um, athletics is 1.2 percent of our budget, and co-curricular is 0.4 percent. Um, health guidance and library costs are 5.8 percent of our budget, and maintenance, insurance, and utility costs represent 7.5 percent of our budget. Oh, and I'm sorry, debt service is 3.2 of our total budget. So our total budget broken down by fund. Um, the general fund re represents our operating budget, so to speak, so that's where all of our operating and day-to-day -day costs are accounted for. Um, and this is a breakdown similar to what I showed you before with the 92.0 million um, beginning number um, compared to the 94.7 million dollars for next year. And then some adjustments for purchase orders and whatnot. So an analysis of the budget increase. Um, just to go back here again, I'm talking original budget, so of the 92.0 million to the 94.7 million. Oops, sorry. So that increase is $2.7 million. Um, what we did here is to take out the non-discretionary parts of the budget to show that the other, what happened to the other parts of the budget. So if we take out 
our special ed costs, which are largely mandated and required by IEPs um, and other um, laws and mandates, if we take our, out our health insurance premiums and we take out our increase in state-required retirement contributions, those three areas alone account for $1.7 million of the increase. Um, so all of the other areas of the budget went up about $943,000 or about 1%. And our staffing, um, we, we did say staffing, our salary costs and benefits represent about 80% of our budget. 47.9% of those staff are regular ed teachers. Another 28.2% of staff are special ed teachers and paraprofessionals um, associated with special ed students and classes. 0.3% um, of our staff are in athletics. 6.4% of our staff are student support, which again is nurses, guidance, and librarians, um, and child study is in there as well. 6.3% um, of our staff are principals, supervisors, and, and building secretaries. 7.54% of our staff are custodian and maintenance personnel, and then 3.5% of our staff are in operations, which would be central office staff um, technology. It's technology staff. Does, I'm sorry, Dana, do those percentages reflect the composition of the staff or the amount of the 80% of the budget? Compos you composition of the staff. Okay, thank you. So in, the, in next year's budget, we do have some staffing changes, um, increases and decreases, um, based on our enrollment and programmatic needs. Um, as Dr. Dolan mentioned, we do expect a decrease in students at the intermediate level. So we have anticipated a 1.8 FTE, so that's full-time equivalent staff. Um, we, did, we do anticipate a decrease there of 1.8 staff members. Um, we also have a number of staff members that are getting paid to teach an extra class. So that's not an FTE decrease, but it is a dollar increase. Um, so in total, we have a projected decrease there. For, did I just say increase? It meant yeah. decrease. <laughs> we have a total decrease there of 166,600. Um, we do have 0.2 of a teacher increase at the intermediate level for a basic skills um, class. We have two teachers added at the high school for enrollment increases, and we also have a 0.4 increase in our Mandarin teacher um, for <coughs> expansion of the Mandarin program there. In special ed, we are adding one resource room teacher at the intermediate level. Um, we have two paraprofessionals increased in the budget, um, and we do have an increase in one FTE for a physical therapist, although we haven't budgeted any increase in funds for that because we anticipate reducing related services that are we currently contract with an outside vendor for um, and we think we can possibly save money by hiring a physical therapist um, so that was kind of a wash hopefully uh, we'll actually be ahead so our total increase there in full-time equivalent staff is 4.8 for next year <coughs> and Dana where's the uh, possible kindergarten have we don't have an increase in kindergarten because we have, um, we think we may have an opportunity to decrease at the elementary level, one to five. So we think we can reallocate staff from the one to five level to the kindergarten level. Is that a collapse or is that a section? No, we believe it's going to be a, a section in first grade, but those numbers are still coming in. I think there was a potential in three of the first grades where we might need fewer sections than this year. So we're anticipating that, but first grade numbers are too fluid at this point. So in the area of technology, education technology, um, we've had a lot of discussion about technology. Um, a while ago, the board had a presentation um, at a workshop meeting um, about technology, and uh, I believe about $3 million was what was presented as our needs. Um, in order to do numerous projects. So what we did is we took that presentation and prioritized it to say what can we um, afford to fund in this budget. Um, the, all of our schools do have wireless access, um, not in every school, but I believe in every building. So one of the areas that we identified a need was to have wireless put into every classroom. Um, and the high school, was the priority for that because 
of the number of devices used at the high school and the applications that they're using at the high school is more of a drain on the wireless access. Um, so that's an area where we feel we need to um, upgrade the, the, the access. In order to upgrade the access, we need to us upgrade the switches at the high school. Um, we also need to install the access points in the classroom. So the, that, the first two items there are upgrading the switches and expanding the high school wireless. Um, that would be to increase the speed of the internet um, and also to expand the wireless access to every classroom in the building. Um, the other, the third item there is virtualizing the district servers. All of our servers currently are getting to the end of their useful life um, and instead of replacing those servers with new servers, um, virtualizing the servers in the long term will save us money. Um, it saves us money on the equipment. It saves us money on electricity um, because it's less of a drain on, on air conditioning and other things. Um, so those are the three areas that we feel needed to be addressed immediately. Um, the total cost of those three areas is $1.1 million. Um, because we didn't have $1.1 million in the 2014-15 budget to devote to this, um, we are recommending that we finance that over a three-year period. Um, so the payments would be $369,509 each year. And that's at a 0% financing rate. Um, so this budget for the 2014-15 budget, we do have 369509 in the budget for the first payment. Um, so if the board agreed with this plan, um, all of this equipment would be installed over the summer um, and in place in September or close to the beginning of school. So a breakdown of the technology budget, 2013-2014. Um, um, you can see going line by line there, we have several small areas, we have license agreements that we need to pay for for various um, programs that we use, we have a repair of equipment, um, we have maintenance contracts that we have for various equipment that we um, have. Um, and software programs that we have that we must maintain. Um, you see highlighted up there in 2014-15 with 369,509. Um, instructional supplies includes funds to replace laptop carts um, and desktops, um, as well as printers. Um, we have internet connection fees, and um, we have cabling and uh, hardware network um, installations for 13-14. Um, so the total original budget for 13-14 for technology was a million one fifty two. Um, this is an area where we did roll over a large purchase order at the end of the school year. So that budget did get increased during the year um, to one point three million dollars. Um, but if you look from the original budget in 13-14 to the budget 14-15, we did increase technology by one hundred twenty four thousand dollars. <coughs> And then the remaining projects um, of the $3 million project that I mentioned earlier, the projects that will not be done with this, um, but in this budget or in the next possibly two to three budgets, um, is replacing the network switches at the intermediate and the elementary schools and in the central office. Um, we will not be upgrading the wireless access at this point in the intermediate and elementary schools. Um, we will not be virtualizing the desktops and the applications, so we are virtualizing the servers, but not the desktop, desktops and applications that run on those servers. Um, and we are not upgrading our network redundancy. So these projects that we have remaining to do are estimated at a cost of $2.4 million. So some areas where we've made changes over the last few years or areas where we're able to, to um, have efficiencies and save money. Um, as I showed you, we do spend below the state average in our per pupil cost and also below many other similar districts. Um, we continue to create and look for new ways to provide programs for special needs students in district, um, which certainly saves us transportation costs. Um, our energy conservation program continues to save us money and we're over $2 million in savings there. Um, we continue savings from purchasing cooperatives and we just uh, joined another cooperative this year to uh, hopefully increase our savings in that area for next year. We continue our shared service, services with the town for equipment, field scheduling and maintenance. Um, 
and continue our cooperative pu per pupil busing with other school districts. Um, so what we do there is for our students that attend out of district placements, our special ed students, um, we share the cost of routes with other school districts. Um, so that if we have a kid going to a school in Summit, um, we can have a kid from Scott Plains and Fanwood or wherever share that cost and um, then it costs us less obviously than if we had to transport that kid um, ourselves. Uh, a new program we're participating in this year is a PSE&G's direct install program. Um, they are providing new lights in three of our buildings. They will only do it in three buildings, otherwise we would have recommended going to more, extending this to more buildings. Um, they will pay for 80% of the cost of the new lights. The district pays for 20%, uh, but the savings are significant. So in, after the first couple of years, after we repay our 20%, um, the savings in our electric and gas bills, our electric bills will be significant. Um, and we also cooperatively purchase our electricity and our natural gas with other school districts. The calendar for the remaining budget discussion um, tonight, obviously, is the first board meeting discussing the budget. Um, we actually have a meeting next week, March 11th, which wasn't in Mr. Matesic's announcement. It should have been, but uh, the originally the March 11th building was, I apologize, that was our, our fault. Um, that budget, that board meeting was originally a workshop meeting, which is why right. it was not on that list. Um, we did change that to a public board meeting because the board will have to adopt a tentative budget that night. Um, the budget is due to the county superintendent on March 20th. Um, and then she will review the budget and has until April, I believe it's April 24th, to respond to us um, whether or not she approves that budget. Um, and then you, you will hold your public hearing after we get the approval back from her. Um, and the public hearing it has to be held within a two-week period. So we have it scheduled for April 29th, um, which is a board meeting date. Um, and the board will adopt the budget that evening. So that concludes the presentation for the 2014-15 budget. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Um, Dana, on page 11, mm -hmm. the one thing that you didn't show me was the origin of the, the top slide, projected dollar increase in the operating budget. I don't see that 2.7 million. I don't see it coming from anywhere. Okay, it's the page before. So if you look at the original budget, original general fund, you see the original it's Do I have to do the, the math in my head? No, the top the top line on the chart. I know. It's do I have to do the math in my head? On that page yeah. you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it does show it shows in the revenue side. <laughs> Hold on. Shows in the revenue side. If you go here. Oh no, I don't have No sorry. you don't. I'm I sorry. didn't show it on the chart. But you didn't. So what am I doing? It's it's I'm just doing the general fund subtraction by, in it, my head. It's the ninety four point seven million less the ninety two point oh. The first line, general fund. You see? Before I, the adjustments. You want my phone? Yeah, I read it on my phone. I promise you. It's going to equal 278587. I promise you. <laughs> I don't mind. I just like continuity in my presentations. Thank you. No more. Any other questions? Any other questions from the board? Can I? Oh, yes, I have another question. Lots of questions. Can I ask Brian a question about technology? Um, Stand up and state your name. <laughs> Dana, thank you for that exhaustive <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> so we, I understand the need for the additional expansion of the wireless in the high school and that we need to do the switches first before we do that. Um, so, but we're talking about putting off uh, additional expansion in the intermediate and the elementary school for what could be a period of four years. So I'm just curious, how, how is it working? How is our current wireless system working in those schools? Currently, for the intermediate schools and the elementary schools, they've been very happy with the coverage that they have. You have to realize that they do not have the same number of mobile carts, whether it be iPad carts or laptop carts. So they do not have the same bandwidth requirements that the high school has been having. In addition, the high school has been identified and they've already started some pilot programs at the high school with Bring Your Own Device. 
a couple of classes, and we have approximately 100 students right now participating in the Bring Your Own Device. We can see the high school getting to the point where hopefully in the very near future, especially if the projects like this go through, that we would be able to possibly expand that to the entire high school. So again, that's something, something I'm not committing to this evening. I'm not at liberty to do that, but we are preparing for that. It is the way of the future. I mean, we, we go anywhere with our devices these days and we can access data, you know, simply by pulling out our phones or our iPads or any other device that we have. So we want to be able to do the same thing. I mean, it's real world experience for our students. So we don't foresee that same thing happening at those lower levels, at least not in the next couple of years. So that's one of the reasons why the, the high school was prioritized. And, and just I would add, because in our technology meeting a few weeks ago, we asked that same question to our master technology teachers mm -hmm. um, who said exactly the same thing and actually uh, were very favorable about how the wireless was working in the intermediate schools specifically and the elementary schools. I mean, they were both really, really pleased with that versus the high school. So... Um when do you foresee, or how much money do you need, or what's needed to get the high school virtualized? Not virtualized servers, but so that virtualized when kids lo log into their own devices, let's say, they're not really using their own devices, they're using our servers. Correct. We're looking, hopefully, where in some districts they're doing one-to-one -one programs where they're issuing students a laptop or an iPad we're actually going to issue them a virtual computer that would be accessible from anywhere. So they could be sitting at home and they could log into their district virtual computer in the evening and they could access the same software and resources they have during a normal school day. They could be working in the media center and again have access to the same software, their same files. So that's a little bit different than actually issuing devices that depreciate very quickly in value as other school districts have done. So in order to address your question about just doing that at the high school, the initial data conversion has to be done from our current infrastructure that we have for student storage. It's currently based on Novell. So we'd have to do data conversion. The second thing we'd have to do is we would have to install the appropriate hardware because the virtualization hardware that we're putting in for the file servers would be completely separate. We'd have to put in separate virtualization servers to support the number of concurrent users that we would suspect that we would need for the high school. Again, we don't have to budget for every single student. We just have to budget for the number of students that we can currently connecting. So we'd probably look in the neighborhood of about 1,000. You know, again, keeping in mind we have about 1,800 students. It'd be very rare that we would exceed 1,000, but again, that would, be, that would depend upon usage. So for the appropriate hardware, the software, and then actually the storage, because again, on a virtual server, all the student files and all the programs are not actually stored on that virtual server, because it is, it's just that it's virtual. So that then goes on to a SAN, a uh, storage area network. So we have a large infrastructure upgrade that we would have to do initially to implement that. And the cost that we worked out to do the entire district with over 3,000 concurrent users was close to a million dollars. To do just the high school, the initial cost would probably be more in the realm of about $500,000 just to support the, that thousand users at the high school. Once the initial investment is put into the equipment, it's much easier to scale it up and increase the number of users. So if we did want to expand it then to intermediate schools and the elementary schools, we could do that. But again, it's difficult to do that until we do the infrastructure upgrades with the new switches and the new access points. Again, which is in this budget for the high school. Right. I'm then high saying school. down right. the line, okay. which is what Gretchen asked about for the other schools. So the 2.4 for remaining projects. Does that include the virtualization that you just talked about? Or the 2.4 would include the virtualization for the, yes, for the entire district of virtualization of desktops and applications. Okay. For both the high school, the intermediate schools, and elementary okay. schools. So, all right. Yes. As well as all as the infrastructure As well as upgrades. the infrastructure upgrades. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Oh, and it says it right there. <laughs> so, so Roseanne's initial question was when? Would the high school have virtualization? I didn't get the answer from what you said. You gave me a lot of data, mm -hmm. and you said that. Well, I think the I said how much and when. <coughs> yeah. All right, yeah. I heard the when. Yeah. Right. Okay. You said you'd virtualize district servers for the high school with our coming budget. 
336,000. Correct. And the when and would the then when. be when we're able to fund the additional $500,000. So again, that's not something we have as a request in, in this, this budget proposed for next year. It may be something we look for the year after. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, but we, so we're funding the work to be done this year over the next three right, years. Right, so that correct? 369 is going to have to right, be in two more budgets after 1415. But the, the work will be done 1415? Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. correct. It will be done this summer. Right. Mark? Stay up there. there. <laughs> right. I mean, it's okay. I'm not going anywhere, Mark. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, but for, before I did that, just as a, an aside, so I, I sit on the Finance Committee. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Dana for the good work and Dr. Dolan and all the administrators and the, and the teachers that have, you know, spent a lot of time putting this budget together. Um, you know, we've only sat through a couple of meetings and um, we, we have lo loads of questions and just the fact that Dana understands all this uh, not-for-profit accounting, um, which we've been back and forth with. Um, so uh, thank you for that. So, uh, Brian, specifically to, to, uh, to the tech. So you, you've done... You know, you, you've done a lot of these presentations, and I know you've talked to lots of different folks in other districts. So just putting out the provocative question, which is part of what we did in, in, in the finance discussion, is are we moving fast enough, right? So if we, if we didn't have, you know, we all have restrictions, and we all have made a lot of decisions about what we, where we want to put our dollars today in this 90-odd million dollar budget. Um, are we moving fast enough? Um, where do, what's your sense of where we stand, you know, if we looked at the districts that um, Dana showed us about spending per pupil as kind of our comp set, where do we stand in, I'm, I'm putting you in the spot, I realize that, Sure. Um, in comparison to them about their level of technical uh, capabilities? It, it's, it's an interesting question because my background was with an urban school district where I originally came from, and in that district, some of the initiatives that we're talking about right now, they've completed and they've already had in place for a few years. Yet I can go to other districts where we're talking about comparable districts to Westfield and they're still not there yet. So we have moved from where I would say when I first started here about four years ago, Westfield was at the back of the pack. We did not have wireless access in most of our buildings. And if we did, it was relegated to just a library, maybe a cafeteria, it was very limited. We also had an internet connection that ran at 10 megabits per second for the entire district to share. I mean, you don't even have that in your home. You have at least 20, 25 megabits at home. So we've bumped that up to over, you know, to 100 megabits now. <laughs> so we already have done a lot. We've, we've probably, we, we've put out uh, laptop cards, iPad cards. We've rolled out new endpoint devices for students to use. So where we've come in just those last couple of years, we've made a tremendous stride forward. Putting in the very basic wireless infrastructure that we did two years ago was also a major step forward, because again, we did not have that previously. So we've gotten better. This will actually get us much further, you know, towards the front of the pack. It will it put us at the very front? No, not yet. You know, you will only start to see that when we start to do more innovative things, such as the one-to-one -one virtual initiative, where we're actually issuing the virtual desktops to the students. So, so when you say this, just want to make it clear so that everybody's on the same page as to what the number is, right? Because that's the most important thing. So if we kind of put out there and said, you know, over, pick, pick a time frame, two years, let's say, if in two years we, sh we wanted to be at the front of the pack, mm -hmm. right, or as close to the front of the pack as is perhaps reasonable, how many million dollars do we need to get there? I believe the slide that Dana had up there that showed the remaining amount that we would look to do to accomplish all the projects that we needed to to get to the, the head of the pack, and that was approximately 2.4? 2.4 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. million. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we have a, a two. So we have a, a two plus million dollar whole, if you will, if we wanted to get to where you're saying. Okay. Can I, Thank you. Can I jump sure. on that? And does that include some of the learning management systems that we need to add to the website? Learning management's not included. No. And, and the reason why I couldn't give you a specific right. cost about that, we've not even evaluated right. a specific okay. one yet to see what the cost checking. would be. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's kind of Paul's area, so, and he and I have talked so about that. 2.4 plus. 2.4 plus, yes. Yes, the 2.4 really is just for your, your infrastructure. Okay, in, in addition, for example, next year there was an increase in the cost for the internet connection. Next year we will be increasing the speed of the internet here in the district by a factor of 10. 
it will go from a 100 megabit connection to a one gigabit connection. So again, that's to again support that the, the speed increases that we will require with again the, the greater amount of traffic that we'll have going in and out of the district. Look at it. Yeah. Okay. So I had uh, two quick questions. So I just want to Dana's words. I want to make sure they're your words as well. Where that, with respect to the, if we do the upgrade high switch high school switches and they expand the high school wireless, that would get us every classroom at Westfield High School having faster being wireless and having faster wireless. Correct. So it would be faster wireless as well as we'd be able to support more devices, as well as these access points are, are, are modern access points of so the latest version you know, uh, from Cisco. And these access points are actually optimized for streaming of video, which is one of the high bandwidth applications that again, most people are sitting there and students want to watch a video. And, and we've all seen it before. You start to watch a few seconds of video and it stops and it starts polling and it's waiting and it's waiting and then, okay, you get a few more seconds and it stops again. We're trying to, to eliminate that. So again, that's why this <coughs> infrastructure is being optimized for what the students are using it for. And how comfortable are you that we won't need something else come September to achieve that? So we were surprised before, understandably, there's Correct. some things at the high school we didn't anticipate. Correct. We're dealing with those now, but how do we know we're dealing with everything. I'm extremely comfortable because we're basing this plan on an actual survey that was conducted by a Cisco engineer who came out and walked through every single classroom at Westfield High School, surveyed the entire building, and then <coughs> wrote up the entire plan based upon that. So we've actually had the entire building fully surveyed so that we know that when we do roll this out, we're not going to find, oops, we have a dead spot over here and we, again, need some additional equipment there and oh no we didn't plan on enough switches to support these access points in this wing of the building so is our contract with Cisco is it essentially here's your endpoint and here's what you're paying for so if something surprising does come up like so is, is the contract uh, we're getting you wire we're getting you faster wireless in every classroom as opposed to you're buying 15 access points so if we find out we needed 18 we don't have to pay for the additional three. That's on Cisco. No. That's not my understanding of what that contract is like. Okay. No. So no, we, we, don't, we don't have a contract at all. <coughs> no, I know we have to do it, but maybe that's right. how we need to do it then. If, if we've used them to come in and survey, and they're selling us their product, telling us what we need, then maybe that should be the way the contract works. I know, something to think about. Yeah, we're purchasing this under a state contract. So, <laughs> the operative know. word. Yeah. yeah. Right. There goes that idea. <laughs> well, we, but we should be cognizant yes, of that. Yes. Because if we come up short. What standard of, yeah. of assessment are you using? Yeah, well, but that's that's right. You know, what are the metrics and, you know, what are the service level agreements of what, what you're buying? Right. My, my, my other question was if, if we were to approve this, uh, recognizing that an additional 2.4 million is needed to achieve where we want to go. What would be the value of this if we decided not to spend that extra 2.4 million? Now, put another way, are we somehow committing ourselves to do everything ultimately? Because no, because currently the switches that we have in place at the high school that we're talking about replacing right now, they're 10 years old. They're approaching end of life. For uh, as a matter of fact, there's no more support available for those switches from the vendor because they are just that, they're end of life devices. So with that in mind, we are going to have to make these improvements. <laughs> this year, next year, the final, you're gonna hear me keep asking for the same items year after year if it doesn't happen now. So we do have to do it. And then, it, you know, are we locked in that, oh, well we bought this and these, are, these things are gonna be end of life a year or two from now, no. Again, what we've looked at is we wanna make sure that at the end of three years, we've not just paid off some devices that are now end of life and are no longer viable. At that point in time, they will still be viable and these will be. These actually incorporate all the latest technologies. I, I can't buy anything better actually. And uh, you know, so we're properly investing these funds in equipment that will still be usable well into the future. As you can see from the existing switches, we got 10 years of life out of the existing ones that we have. So we've been chugging along at the last few years. Uh, I would expect these, these switches to do the same thing. Same thing with the access points. The access points are upgradable. They currently will be equipped with the fastest speed, which is 802.11 AC, technical term, you know, and that is gigabit wireless, but they are expandable beyond that. So it's not just a matter of now we have to go and replace all the access points. 
down the road, we find out five years from now we need to upgrade the access points, we can replace a module in the access point and it'll be much, much more cost effective to replace the module than the entire access point. Thank you. Brian, um, when you look at uh, other districts that have kind of leapfrogged over the last decade, you know, Pascack Valley and Springfield are two that come to mind that, you know, done a lot with technology. Is there anything that you've noticed that they've done from a funding standpoint, um, where there are more grants, where they're just, you know, just making sure we're looking at every possible aspect, you know, of, of, of what's out there? Uh, again, from your own research, because I know you look at all these other districts correct. and see what they're doing. We look at the other districts and see, and in, in the past, I do know of a few, a very few uh, school districts that were able to, to obtain grants. Usually, they uh, had a corporation that resided in the town mm -hmm. that funded the grant right. for them, and that's how they were able to obtain it. There are very few grants out there these days for equipment. So it's usually tied to maybe what, what a class is doing, but it's for a much smaller amount. We're not going to find anyone that's going to fund $2.6 million worth of networking infrastructure upgrades, unfortunately. But we do welcome anyone that would like to. Uh, <laughs> we do. Sorry. Brian we do. said that the technology committee's chairman usually writes a big check. <laughs> <laughs> Along and, with the as does the finance committee the chairman to cover all chair. budget right. surplus, but that's I think it's okay. It's a matching. <laughs> <laughs> But along those lines, I do want to just mention that one of the advantages of actually bundling these three projects together is that because we're doing this purchase at one time, we're actually able to obtain a greater discount from Cisco than we would if we broke these out. The, the, the discount, the state contract discount, is approximately a 40, 42% discount off of list price. With this, we'll be able to exceed 50%. So we, we, we are actually obtaining a greater discount by doing this three-year purchase as opposed to actually doing these th as three separate projects and spread out over three years. Is it possible to verify, though, that it's still a good discount? So it may be that large companies get a 70% discount. Is there any way to, to know that? No, not really. Uh, at least not that I would have what about, any what about connection to other it. schools. I could check with other schools, but again, they're they're usually bound by the same contracts. It's it's state contract state. pricing. You know, the best you could do is you could go out to bid, but normally what happens with vendors such as Cisco, they have a couple of uh, their resellers, and they are only going to work with one of their resellers on a certain project, and they'll give them the best pricing. So ultimately, we're buying it from Cisco through one of their resellers. I keep saying Cisco, Cisco, Cisco. We're actually not going to be cutting a check to Cisco. It will be through one of their resell partners. And that is the partner that will actually do, will resell the equipment to the district and will be responsible for the installation. Cisco, of course, is backing it the whole time. But of course, uh, yeah. let's just talk about the contract a second. Back to your point before. This contract <coughs> is really not for design. So I, I don't think you're going to get wording in a contract because really what you're what you're purchasing through Cisco or whomever is the equipment and the installation of the equipment. They're, we're not paying them through any contract or anything to design a system that they're going to guarantee. I want to make sure we're clear about that. Right, and I, and I, I guess my premise was why don't we buy a solution, not pieces? No, the money. I would, I would have to say that we are doing that. It, it may not appear that way, but I referenced the vendor that came out. The company is Core BTS. Core BTS uh, is, is a company, it's a, wholesale, a resale integrator that, of course, is a, is a Cisco partner. They're a platinum partner, which is the highest level of Cisco partnership you can obtain uh, from Cisco. There's gold and other levels. So they are the highest level, and that is because of the number of high-level Cisco certified engineers they have on staff. And they actually came out and they wanted to do this survey because they knew of the problems that we had previously. They saw what had happened at the high school previously, that there were some areas that we should have had additional equipment installed and it was not put in at that time. So they came out and, out of, you know, they did not charge the district to do the survey. And I did not bring it with me this evening, but I have on a very large 14 by 17 inch sheets of paper and I did share it with the technology committee that they actually came out, and that was the engineer that they devoted to for an entire week. I mean, the, the, engine, you know, the cost to get an engineer out is usually $200 an hour. And they sent him out here for free for an entire week to walk through all of the schools. He didn't just do the high school. He actually ended up surveying all of our schools and put together the plan so that we have a plan that we can use now 
We can use it next year. We can use it the following year. It's been it's been checked. He walked it with our network manager. Uh, so I'm very confident in, in the plan that they've developed that it is exactly what we need and that we sh we will not encounter <coughs> those issues that we had previously. Thank you. Thanks. So with the um, bring your device to school program, what's it called? Bring your own device, BYOD. Okay. <laughs> um, what are we going to do for kids who don't have the latest phone or an iPad? That's number one. And secondly, how do we, for lack of a better word, like police that? Like, how do we know that kids aren't just texting and looking at Facebook? First of all, the easiest one to answer there is Facebook. Things like that are already blocked through our existing filters that we have in place. Okay. So that's already blocked. If, if I <coughs> use my phone right now and try to go to Facebook, I'm not going to be able to get through the network to Facebook. So items like that are blocked to begin with. Uh, to get back to the devices, so how do we handle inequality? You know, this individual has the latest laptop or latest iPad while this student has nothing or has a, you know, a, a three, four year old device. The advantage to virtualization and providing the students actually not with a dedicated device, but instead giving them access to that virtual machine is that if I have the latest device and someone else has an older device, that virtual machine will run at the same speed on both of them because the device is only showing you, it's acting as a gateway to the virtual machine that's actually running back on the file server back in our data center at the high school. So your older machine runs just as fast as my brand new machine. So there we have created equality. So for example, if you have a student that's taking a video editing course and they're using some type of high-end video software that might run on that new high-end laptop but not on your older laptop, with the virtualization, it would run on both equally just as well. So we've created the equality there. Now, how do you address if a student does not have a device? Well, that's where we'd have to start looking if, if there's anything we can do with maybe older devices that we would have retired and taken out of service. Maybe we can substance some sort of a program there. Maybe we can get donations of people's you know, used devices and they would like to, to get rid of them. We could take them and actually see about distributing them to students. So we'd have to substance some sort of a plan like that. help students. Correct. And of course, we will. It, this is not to say that even with the BYOD program, we're going to stop having access to laptop carts at the high school and computers in the media center and things like that. They will still be there. The devices will still be there. So at least in the school, the devices are available and accessible. So you addressed Facebook and what about the texting? So texting, things like that. You know, I, I really, it, it comes down to, again, uh, we can put in all the policies and all the acceptable use agreements and things like that. And it comes down to, to being uh, policed by the, the, the teachers in the, in the actual classroom. Uh, I can't completely stop all of those things. Uh, it's, it would be a hindrance to the students that might be using it for a legitimate purpose. So it really comes down to in the policy, how the policy is written and how it's then implemented and enforced in the classroom and at the high school or any other school in the district. Any other questions specific to technology? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Other Thank keyword you. questions on any part of the market? Mark? <clears throat> so I, I think this is for Dana and, and perhaps Dr. Dolan. So you know we've heard about the technology needs, and I'm sure there's other things, other areas of the budget um, of the district that we'd like to invest in. And you know I, I think one of the things that uh, Dana talked about in the uh, presentation is that. One of the things that we're doing, I think it's differently this year than what we have done in prior years, is we're using the banked cap. Um, so to get us from over the well, from the two percent cap, we're using um, the bank cap um, from the past few years and from the current year. So that allows us to, within the rules, use some dollars to help fund other programs and, and things in the district. What, what have, I, I'm sure you, I, I know you guys have thought about this. Every, everything we put into the budget is a decision, right? So if we were to challenge ourselves and say, look, there's other things that we want to invest in more aggressively, what, what are the kind of levers that you have to help fund some of those things? So let's use technology, right? So we said, you know, we needed $2.4 million over, you know, two years here or three years in order to get us where we wanted to be. What are the levers that we have to pull, to change, to think about doing differently that would help us fund those kinds of initiatives. So 
the first thing we would look at, I think, is the non-instructional area. So I mean, obviously what we want to do first is not, not hurt the classroom. Um, so we look at the support areas of the budget. The problem that we currently have with doing that is when the budget cuts were made, the state aid was cut drastically in 2010. Um, certainly there were a lot of instructional reductions made then, but there were also a lot of non-instructional um, reductions made. Um, and because it's a smaller area of the budget, we don't have as much flexibility there and as much room to, to make adjustments. Um, but that would be, of course, the first place that we look and say, what can we do um, differently? You know, very hard right now to make reductions, more reductions in those areas. Um, so then what it does is it moves into instruction. Um, we obviously cannot make reductions in mandated areas of the budget and in mandated programs. Um, so we look at the non-mandated programs. Um, certainly class size is an area that we'd, we'd have to look at seriously um, at all levels. Um, probably curricula, extracurricular activities, athletic activities, fine arts. Um, we'd have to look at offerings at the high school. Um, because we have such a successful high school, school with successful kids, we have a lot of offerings at the high school. Um, so we'd have to look at those areas. Um, and come to the board and make recommendations or get your direction as to what areas would be areas you don't want us to, to look at and what areas would you want us to. It would be probably a change in, in policy or in program that we currently have, um, which is what we didn't want to do, which is why we are recommending adjusting the cap this year. But it is going to be continued, I'm sorry, no, okay. continued discussion every year with, <coughs> with a 2% cap, as, as you well know, as we have increases in our salaries and benefits, um, you know, which is a large part of the budget. This is a discussion that we're going to continue to have every year as we develop our budget. And I would just add that, um, you know, we talked a lot about technology, and it's no doubt technology has changed all of our worlds, both at home and at work. Um, so we've already seen in our budgets changes in the budget because technology does some things better or more efficiently, and I think we're going to continue to see opportunities like that. Um, I mean, for example, already we buy fewer textbooks. doesn't mean textbooks are bad, but it does mean there are a lot of positives about having um, the information <coughs> digitally. And um, there is an awful lot available on open source. Um, for not, it's not perfect for every course or every age level, absolutely, but it is for a lot of different age levels. And how technology helps um, certain aspects of operations in the district. We've already seen changes. I mean, it's, some things as simple as we used to spend a lot more on postage. You know, we don't spend a lot on postage anymore. There's very little that goes out. So there are those every year, um, actually, as we go through the individual budgets with um, every administrator, we talk about that because technology does help you in some ways. Yes, it costs money, no question, but it also helps you. And how does that, how can we use that to transform what we're doing both in our offices and certainly also with our students? So I think there are continuing opportunities for change in costs with, with technology. Thank you. Dana, is there opportunities <coughs> for longer term financing, not quite 20 year bonds, but if a server has a eight year life, we finance that without having to go out for no, a bond? There's restrictions on, on financing that we can do. Um, it's maximum, I believe, five years okay. that we can do. Um, we are actually, we do have the board attorney reviewing this to make sure that, that what we want to do here right. is okay um, because we'd be purchasing off of state contract and then financing it um, through a company at a zero percent interest rate. So we're getting an okay before we obviously move forward right. with that. Um, but the longest we could do is five years and we'd have to figure out legally how to, how to gotcha. do that. Because that could make the 2.4 more doable right right and you do i mean you also have the option i know it's not popular but just to put it out there you do have the option of the bond referendum um you also have the option of a separate proposal um so that you could put this out as a second question so to speak um it would go to the voters in november um if it was approved it would be in, added to your budget and if it wasn't it wouldn't I mean, those are just other areas. Sure, can you just expound on, on that a little bit? So let's assume we wanted to fund, make it a nice round number, $3 million for technology in the district. What are the options that we have available to us with respect to bringing it to a vote? Well, 
you could well you could go out to a bond referendum like we did with the roofs, the roofs right, right. right you would determine what the useful life of that would be um, so you could go out for a bond referendum or you could go t for a separate proposal so a separate proposal is part of your operating budget um, but it's voted on above and beyond your cap so it would be a, in November it would go out to the voters as a separate question um, they would vote yes or no um, and if it was not approved, then you would not be able to add it to your budget. So you're not allowed to then say, I'm going to reallocate from other areas of the budget to do that work. You would not be allowed to do it. Um, and if it was approved, your budget would increase by $3 million, and you would be able to do the work that year. Um, the difference between that and a bond referendum is separate proposal has an immediate impact to the taxpayers. A bond referendum gets paid back over whatever the useful life of the, the project would be. I thought we couldn't bond technology. Well, it, it depends. I mean, that would be, it, it depends on what we're doing in technology. That, that would be a question we'd have to look at. We, we might have to look at the whole thing together and see which pieces would be available for mm -hmm. bonding. Um, some of it is if it's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but we'd As have to look to at yeah, the size of equipment. And exactly right. what we're okay. doing. You can't bond instructional materials. Right. Uh, Mr. Facilities Chairman, question for you. <laughs> um, so when we discuss budgets every year, obviously we have wants and needs, and um, facilities is always a big area, and obviously we've done a lot with roofs and, and, and you know everything we've done recently. I'm curious from your perspective, because I'm not in those meetings, what, what are some of the wants and needs that have come up? Where are we? What, what can't we do? What, what do people want to do? You know? get a little sense of there's actually a long list and yeah. there's a five-year plan mm -hmm. and we're, we're doing a um, it's either next week or the week after part of the presentation uh, 25th I 25th mm -hmm. we're doing a facilities uh, presentation to explain what's in the budget and what's coming down the road and so that includes not only the top projects at every school but projects related to security at every school Mm -hmm. which was sort of a new ad over the past year. Um, I don't have off the top of my head, I mean, the biggest one, there's the usual things, right. boilers, mm -hmm. right? I think the boilers are the biggest in the list. Um, at the high school, there's some small projects we do a little bit each year, like lockers. Um, do you remember off the top of your well, head? Well, we're also, this? because of, you know, we, we, rod right, we submitted 64 rod grant applications, 62 right. or 64 rod grant applications this year. Um, and we did receive a number of them. Um, we can't certainly do all of them that we received, but we've, we've kind of reprioritized some projects. For instance, the generator at the high school, which we may not have done in the next year or so. Um, it looks like we're probably going to recommend doing that because the state will fund 40% of it. Um, so we've kind of reprioritized and want to maximize the state funds while they're there because um, they, they won't be probably after this. Um, so and so I should have said that, and that is that will be show. We'll show instead of just looking at one year, we're going to show two years, because that's the time period over which we can take advantage of the grants, and we've split up security in phase one, phase two to show what we'll do over the next two years, and then the third component will just be the the pieces of the five year plan that fall into those two years, but the the dollars for that aren't in the operating budget. No, no, they so, would come out of maintenance reserve or capital reserve, right. depending so on the project. At the end of the year, if there's nothing available, then there's we don't have a source of funds to do any of those projects. Right. So, and that'll be the board discussion is really prioritizing them for the dollars that we do have. Great. Um, one thing that has come up at the facilities committee um, two times ago was the need for um, sound improvement at both Edison Intermediate School and Roosevelt Intermediate School. As you know, yeah. when you go to those shows, um, <clears throat> it's just terrible. These kids yeah. have, you know, they've been practicing for three months, and when they talk directly to the audience, you can hear every word they say, but as soon as they turn like this to talk to their fellow actor, it's, it's wiped out. You're you can't hear either. it. I'm sorry? Sometimes in the back you can't even hear yeah. it. And sometimes in the back. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think that that needs to move up the list, uh, the sound. And I know it's a big job. It's not just microphones. It's um, having someone come in and really assess what we need. Do we need carpeting? Do we need panels on the walls? They're old, um, they're old facilities, the both 
And they're all facilities yeah. issues. No, there's a, and they're old facilities oh, that old need facilities, upgrades, yes. especially yeah. Roosevelt. <laughs> So um, we have started to talk about that, and I think that's important. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Jenny? With all the data that you've given us, Dana, and I do appreciate all the data, what I don't have is really what I like to use to make decisions on, mm -hmm. interestingly. So, <laughs> so I'm at a loss because um, what I would look for is categorical increases amount percentages year over year. Um, I think I can calculate it based on some of the data that you gave us independently. Um, but it, it would be wise to see yeah. how either department expenditures or instruction dis expenditures or um, categories of spending uh, have changed year over year from a percent basis. And one thing you, you didn't mention, which I think is crucial to the conversation, and for the public's understanding of our cost increases is the cost of health insurance. And I'm, I'm at a loss as to why it wasn't mentioned. Uh, the increase in health insurance was on one of the slides. It, it was on the slide where I showed the non-discretionary. Mm -hmm. um, that was the increase in health insurance. Um, and also, as far as the but detail... But was it, did you really call it out? Yeah. I, okay, I must have been sleeping. Um, the, it's on page thinking about Page something. 11, increase in health insurance premiums? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Um, yeah. 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 Page the, seven. the percentage data increase that but you budgeted is, is what, year over year? In health insurance? Yes. The overall increase is about 7%. I increased the, the health I insurance about 10%. And then it off, was offset by contributions from employees. It's on the top of page 11, the top slide. Of oh, the 760,000? Yeah. Well, how does anybody attribute that to any percentage? I mean, there, there, a number is a number, but relative to anything else, it just floats. From well, in, in, <laughs> in this document, but the first, to your, to your point about departmental expenses and whatnot, yeah. um, in the larger PowerPoint that we I can use, calculate it. It's, it's set out. It's set out. It's percentages. In well, the dollar, the, the dollar change. The I know the dollar changes. changes are there. Yeah, you'd have to do a little bit of math. I would, because yeah. because we're at a two percent cap, so it's rel it's relevant for me to understand what going up more than two percent, less than two percent, just and it, for a comparison basis. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I can't point. look at dollar figures and know, you know, seven hundred thousand dollars in in one department versus two hundred thousand dollars in another department. They may be a, the same percentage, or one may be a hundred percent versus another one's 1%, so. I can give you that. Thank you. Anyone else from the board? Questions on the budget? How long do purchase orders roll over for? Is, do they time out or can they, they technically be outstanding indefinitely? No, sure not they, uh, no, they do. <coughs> they have to be paid within 90 days. Um, of the receipt of the of, of bill by you? Yeah. July 1st. Yeah. Okay. Um, so little, by like September, the end of September, they're all, if there's not, work is not completed and paid, then they're pretty much closed unless there's a unique circumstance. Gotcha. So there's nothing from 2008 that's still outstanding? No, that, that used to happen many years ago, but <laughs> once we had to go on gap, that doesn't happen anymore. <coughs> so I just, I just want to clarify to see if I heard you correctly. Um, health insurance has been budgeted to go up 10 percent. So within our budget, you have this proposed budget. Health insurance, because of trends that you've noticed, and I'm assuming because of our, what our insurance broker has told you. Is and our experience has been. Right. Our experience has been. So there is 10% increase in health insurance cost. It, it's, there was a 10% increase in the health insurance cost. That's offset a little right. bit. So a the, little bit. The increase is about 6.7, I believe, okay. is what's in there now. Okay. Um, because of contributions from employees that will increase as well. Okay. okay. But that's a very large increase yes, of health yes. insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're still within the cap, let's just say, with the adjusted cap, with the legal cap. So Correct. while maintaining programs mm -hmm. and maintaining staff. So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. Well, it's 
interesting. So but three cheers for us. <laughs> it's interesting, but it's certainly what every organization ha is faced with these right. days. You know, uh, I don't care what the organization is, everyone is grappling with the same thing. You know, um, so yes, it's it's what we all have to do at this point. And it, it's kind of a good segue because I, I tend to bring this up all the time. So as we kept talking, I might as well just bring it up. You know. We're, we're faced with it every year. Now, last year was an aberration. And the question is, as we move forward here, if there is a continued cap, and there's some question whether the cap will continue or not, if you get a new governor at, you know, at some point in, in the future, near future, you know, are we doing enough today to look at the ways to do our business a little bit differently? So are we entertaining enough of the tough questions of, you know, the classroom instruction. So what Dana brought up before, you know, we have mandated, well, our own mandated guidelines about class sizes. I'm not for large class sizes necessarily. I'm not suggesting that. All I'm suggesting is are we looking at it aggressively enough to say, can we do things a little bit differently, or frankly, a lot differently, so that we can continue to invest in the things that we want to invest in, perhaps, and also deal with the increasing costs that we continue to have. And as Roseanne pointed out, we're dealing with a net 7% increase on health insurance. We have our labor costs go up, you know, o over time. And with the 2% the cap, the math just, just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And as also Dana pointed out, the non-labor, you know, side of the budget is, let's say, 20%. So you make the math easy, you have $20 million that you can action that's not, and it's probably less than that because there's mandated things in there. So there's very little wiggle room for us in the non-labor. So the only way to find the dollars to invest in technology or in the facilities things that we want to invest in and be and facing dollars. health insurance is to look, about, look at doing this a little bit differently. I, I'm not an educator. I don't know the, the ways to do it differently. But I, I think that it's important for us to really have these conversations. And if we have to do it publicly, we should do it publicly. But I think we need to have those, those, those discussions. I agree. I, I don't know how, Mr. President, we, we do that. Um, but I, 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 just my opinion. Well, I think it's part of the budget discussions and, and can be had throughout the year, but ideally leading into the budget. Um, I think in in your your thought, well, you have to answer this, but I think in your thought process, you do some of that as you're building the budget, mm -hmm. because I don't think you just take the old numbers and slap mm -hmm. on more. Right. You start at each building, and and look at needs. You're talking about something a little differently, which is to say, I, I get, I understand these are your needs, and these how we 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 can meet them. Let's give me three other ways to do it. What are the yeah, pros I, and cons? And there may not be any good answers, but at least we've gone through the exercise of looking at other ways. Right. Well, I mean, I'm, look, I'm 100% confident that that the administration, Dr. Dolan and Dana, have been very thoughtful in going through this. I mean, I've, I've sat through a number of those discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is, you know, I think our role as the board is to be pushy, if you will, of, of forcing the administration to come back with alternatives so that we can ultimately say to ourselves, you know what? We discussed every alternative. We discussed the alternatives of increased class size. We discussed any other alternatives that you want to put in front of us, and yet we still feel that what you brought to us in the budget is the appropriate way to, to do it, and it just means that we're not going to be able to fund technology more aggressively than we can today, and we're going to have the same you know, kind of path of facilities that you know, we've, we've laid out, and we're going to have to find other ways to deal with health insurance costs. Right, and, and I would say, and I think, I think all the administrators Dana and I speak with, um, we don't assume it's going to be the same next year. We do ask, um, um, I guess your word was provocative questions, um, and do see if there are other ways to do things, uh, and do make some changes, and probably don't discuss all of them now because it's a big budget, um, and do go through, and do talk to other districts about what they're doing, and. Um, um, and again, I would say, you know, look to how is technology going to help us, but in a way that still gives the students the, the education that they need. And that it's an interesting time right now, 
I mean, some districts are jumping ahead a lot to uh, doing um, a lot of online courses. I was talking to a yeah. district where 10% of their students um, <laughs> Um, are only taking online courses, and these are high school students, high school and intermediate, actually, 10%. Uh, it is, a, it is, is it definitely a, a trend. It it's not a rural district, no. Yeah. And when I listened and asked questions, it, it would not be what I would want for Westfield, honestly. I mean, I think you can take great online courses, don't get me wrong. Um, um, I think these are young students, and most research tells you what is uh, most important is um, um, not only the knowledge that they learn, but the spark that's given between a, a teacher who is skilled, who can, it, uh, can find that spark in a child. So do I think we're going to see more and more online work? I do. Uh, do I think in the somewhat near future things will be transformed? Yeah, I do. You know, I think the learning management system we talk about is going to help that quite a bit. But I really hope we don't jump to, again, this one district I was talking to where 10 percent of the kids are sitting at home and just working online when they're that young. I don't think that's good. A mix, a mix can, can be good, can, can really transform education. Um, and again, we've been, we've been part of conversations throughout the state and actually with other states, because you can do that easily online, about how to, to get there. But I don't want to jump because I'm seeing people moving too quickly and I don't think it benefits the kids. It might save that district money, by the way. Um, well, sure, labor costs go down. Well, it did, and then yeah. all of a sudden they had to hire all these people to, I uh, had odd names for them, but to organize Moderate. them. Right, you have to have monitors. And, yeah. And, and, I, um, I, I would think in the high school, certainly, at least whatever little research I've done, I've seen more high schools mm -hmm. because you have so many universities now that are offering pretty much every semester at least one on online course kids are taking. Right. So it becomes almost a preparation um, to teach that, to have that in the high school. Right. So there definitely are a lot of options out there yeah. and, and um, some better monitored than others, some um, more mature, but there are so many online Absolutely. possibilities, no yeah. question. I, just to go back to Mark's point for a minute, I don't want, it certainly doesn't have to happen tonight, it's not, I, but Mike, I do wonder when is the time to do it, because if, I mean, now we're in the throes of it, the, the, the budget's been built, you know, from the ground floor up with the building principles, when is the appropriate time for us to say, if we wanted an extra half a million dollars to put into technology, come back with three alternatives for us to take a look at, I mean, when when does that conversation happen? Right now, it seems like it's a little late in the game to have that conversation. How far in advance? Is it something that we say for next year and then a couple of us might be gone next year and the board may think differently? So I, I just don't know when. I think it is a really worthwhile conversation to have. When do we have it? So I think it's an ongoing conversation that should never stop. It's an expectation by the board that it is that's part of an assessment <coughs> but it can be ongoing and and because it takes time to analyze processes <coughs> and it takes time to evaluate impact if you want to pilot something or not it's it doesn't just take place it's much too late now for this budget you're absolutely right so Dana, you but have it's to never too late on an ongoing basis to ask for set up some criteria and ask for some assessments of programs. You have to build the budget, Dana. What, you know the time cycle. Well, but here's, here's, well, so you need to have this discussion if you wanted to get it into the budget document, let's say. So you wanted it reflected in the budget that we submit. Um, you'd have to have this conversation starting in probably the fall because you would want to have public input and whatnot depending on what kind of changes you were making or at least early very early January so that by this point you'd be there um, but the budget is a budget which means you can adjust this so, it's moving. Um, so we we adopt a budget um, within <coughs> certain parameters we can make reallocations mm -hmm. um, so it's not as though just because we adopt this that's it it's set in stone and nothing can change um, so you can have a discussion and say you know we're gonna change whatever you're going to change, and we'll reallocate funds from this account to that account. There are parameters around what we can do with that, but they're pretty broad as far as transferring money into accounts. So um, you, so that discussion can be had at any point, outside, you know, kind of outside of the budget process. Right. Okay. 
That's a good point. Yeah. Anyone else from the board? Jenny. I have a, I'm sorry, I have a data question mm -hmm. again. On page seven, Dana, this is a- uh, Page seven, I'm sorry. Yes. Regarding the, it's really just about banked adjustments mm -hmm. and then the current year uh -huh. cap adjustment. Um, so I understand that we have banked adjustments from prior years, and if we don't use them, or at least the oldest one. The 11, 12 would go If we don't away. use it now, we, we right. lose it. And Correct. if we use it, we have to use all banked adjustments. You, you no, you have to, what use, was your you have to use 14, 15 first. So the adjustment that's available in the 14, 15 budget has to be used first. Oh, I see. And then so then we use, have to use all of them. Then you can use 11. No, you don't oh, have to use all of them. We don't have to use 13, but, 14. Right, correct. <laughs> okay. So the 13, 14 could have. Is the not only been one used, we wouldn't have to use. And that would have carried for one more year. Okay. For now, two, two years. Sorry. Now the 14, 15 is an adjustment that is applied to this budget that we're working on now. Correct. Okay. So it's it's not as if we had known about it or it was part no. of last year's budget. No, no, it's no. because of the cost of health insurance that we're looking at projected within this budget allocation. That's correct. Thank you. Yes. All right, there were members of the audience who had asked to speak about the budget. Please come to the podium, just state your name and address, and we'll answer your questions. Anna. Uh, over, over. How long I'm sorry? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay, now we, got we can share. <laughs> It's great, thank you very much. Thank you. This is going around. Well, that, yeah, that's going around. <laughs> yeah. And this is the this is just sort of a you guys just saw I didn't get this, yeah. right? No, okay. so, there you uh, go. And that's going to be those two books. And we even have technology. Anyways, it's um, good to be short, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyways, Amy Flax, 93 Fairhill Drive. I would like to thank Dr. Dolan, Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Sullivan, Mr. Matejic, and all members of the Board of Ed for the opportunity to speak and their service to the school district. I am honored that Westfield has such a fabulous and well-known performing arts and fine arts program. All three of my children, I am blessed that have the opportunity to participate and benefit from these programs, the orchestra, the band, the chorus, art and drama and theater. You previously received a letter which outlined many needs for both Roosevelt Intermediate School and Westfield <coughs> High School auditoriums. Since both of these schools are in the process of producing their spring musicals and both schools have had to hire outside professional staff to do the lighting, we have kindly received feedback from Sharp Edge Lighting, which is one of the handouts that you have, about the dire lighting situation at Roosevelt Intermediate School. We will get inter excuse me. We will get additional information about the state of Westfield High School from Sharp Edge Lighting, and we will provide that information to the board at a later date. Anyways, you have this letter in front of you, which you received a lot of it earlier. Um, we have had to use funds to hire a sound professional to provide technical oversight on, of the sound both in the fall and spring productions. Currently this is not in the budget because this hadn't been in the past handled, handled by the TV studio teacher. The current teacher is not contracted to fill this need. That cost is approximately $2,000 per show. If you look on this lovely iPad, you can see the seats of both Roosevelt Intermediate School and the apron of Westfield High School. We require, we would be great to have the purchase of a curtain or other coverage for the front of the apron of the stage. Right now, it's like a tarp with holes in it. And these auditoriums are really our living rooms. The entire community uses them, not just the theater arts program. But this is where we welcome the community. And those facilities should reflect the state of the art for the kind of programs that we do have in this district. Um, we also need repairs and improvements to our lobby at Westfield High School. The lobby is sort of the entrance to your house. Unfortunately, after many years of use, 
there's a lot of tacks, there's nails. It's just not a welcoming space. Um, and it would be lovely to display all of our awards in the case that's in the front. Press around. You can swipe and see the pictures. We didn't, we didn't get to email them to you. We're kind of like in progress. RIS, as Ms. Kerry just mentioned, the acoustics and the appearance of the auditorium really are rather deplorable. The seats are defaced with an exorbitant amount of graffiti. We have decaying hinges which affect the, the, the sounds as the doors open and close in those rooms. And as you know, it is a very old space. But the fact that it is such an old space, the acoustics are really dreadful. Yeah. When you even talk about a theater production or a student at the, at the welcome back at the beginning of the year, I can't hear the poor president of the student organization speak and address our community. And so I understand we're dealing with a very old space, but it is a desperate repair. Um, also at Roosevelt Intermediate School, there are no funds to really provide technical oversight of the lights and sound at both the fall and spring productions. This had in the past has been done by the TV studio teacher, but now we need to go out and contract this. Um, you have a letter from Sharp Edge Lighting. They're actually doing our lighting and sound at Roosevelt for the spring musical, and they were very kind to provide us for, uh, with a list of needs. Many of our problems at both Westfield High School, and I'm sure it's true at Edison as well and Roosevelt, is that we are not investing in maintaining those rooms. And so due to that, one example is we have a real, an old light board at Roosevelt that is very dirty. And it is working at only 20% of its efficiency because we have not invested in maintenance. And there's a lot of things in both those auditoriums that we have fell behind on on just maintaining the space. And really, I would really encourage you as part of the budget to include the maintenance of the auditorium as part of those fees and to look at what equipment has fallen apart or broken over the years and needs replacement. But if those rooms actually had a maintenance budget year to year, we clearly would save more money in the long term because if you end up with a light board, that is running at 20% efficiency, it could cost a lot to overhaul it, or it could cost a complete replacement. But if we maintained it each year, it's kind of like maintaining your car, it's less expensive over time. And I think somehow those rooms have kind of fallen off the radar in terms of maintenance and being maintained as part of the budget. And those rooms don't only serve just our theater students, they serve our choral students, they serve our cultural arts, they serve when we rent the space out to other schools or other places to come in and use it. Those spaces are used by the entire community. And right now they really are in great disrepair. Um, many of the light, lighting fixtures need repair at Roosevelt. They need basic things at the high school and the middle school, such as gaff tape, which isn't even in our budget. Um, I will note at the end of your note that they do have a lovely new lighting board at the high school. I will tell you, though, that is in the category of everything else. We can buy a lovely new lighting board. But if we do not invest in maintaining that lighting board, then the expenditure over time is really a waste of money. So, so you've seen the lovely iPad pictures. Sharper Edge Lighting is going to actually do another analysis for us at the high school. I would really like no. to encourage the board to look at all these auditoriums in terms of sound and lighting and acoustics and maintenance and start to look at that as part of our ongoing budget. Um, we have such phenomenal programs in this school district. Those spaces should be on par with what we are actually presenting in terms of the performing arts and what kind of companies like the New Jersey Festival Orchestra who performs at the high school come in and use our facilities. So, we as parents, and there's a few here with me, are willing to work with the board on getting any information necessary 
to move to yearly maintenance of these facilities, specifically the auditoriums, established facilities for our superior performing arts programs that the students, the faculty, and our community deserve. Once again, thank you for your service to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Can thank I ask you. a question? Yeah. Just for clarity. First of all, thank you. <coughs> I think you will find many fans on the board um, uh, of the fine arts, and have, well, a lot of us have students that have participated in the fine arts. I, I'm just confused about, you said that the TV studio teacher, and maybe Dr. Dolan's question for you, used to handle the lights, but now you have to go out and contract it. Why is that? Um, I'm not 100% sure of the details of that. I do remember at a certain point when you saw that dip in the um, state funding, we definitely, you remember on the chart year by year state funding? Mm -hmm. I yeah. think we, that's when it We definitely change. cut a number of not only positions stipends. in this district but stipends and a number of them have not been put back, not just fine arts, but a number of them have not come back at all. So, that oh, so might be matter. the case. It's a, it's a, okay. it's I, I'm not positive, matter. but it's I think not. it is. Okay. Um, and the reason Edison isn't on here just because none of y'all are We're from Edison. We're not from Edison. Or, okay. Exactly. But because they do say. pretty good shows too. Yeah. I. I would argue. <laughs> 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 I mean, we're, we're, we're Roosevelt and Westfield High School parents, so that's our familiarity. But I, I, you know, I've been in that space as well. I think if I were to communicate, I think Westfield High School right. should be the jewel and the epitome of what an auditorium in our district should be. It is in disrepair for whatever reason or another. There are things that are just not maintained that go in the background that support the functions that happen in that space. I would say the same is true at Edison as it is at Roosevelt. And one of the things we're not doing is we're not maintaining those very, very important spaces that we use for so many purposes. And I, I'll say my children are in the band, are in the orchestra, performing arts. We have cultural arts. And I, my personal favorite is the back to school night at Roosevelt where I can't hear anybody speak. I don't think any of us disagree with you. Yeah. yeah. And, issue. you know, I would implore you to, to look at, as budgeting, that those rooms do need maintenance. And over time, maintaining things and maintaining equipment is much cheaper than always buying new equipment. But right now, we're not maintaining, so now we end up in this catch-up where we can't hear people, and we haven't invested in the equipment. And of course, you can, it's just like the technology that the gentleman spoke about earlier. You know, it's an investment in those rooms and in those spaces. And of course, everything has a lifetime. I mean, of course, a lighting board might only last 10 years, and we have to replace it but far better to maintain it and replace it every 10 years than to end, it, end up in total disarray and disrepair after two or three years because we didn't do anything to it. So there's like two phases. I think there's upgrades that are needed to those facilities that need to bring it on par to where they deserve to be. But I also think that we need maintenance for each of those spaces. And really, the better those spaces are, I would imagine you could rent them out to other people as well, you know. So I just hope you guys consider that in your budget because it's very important to me as a parent. Can I, Dana, can I ask you a question? Just on maintenance. So I, I read this letter in about two seconds, but one of the lines that popped out, it was that the, the lighting, the lighting fixtures are, are really dirty. Mm -hmm. So as, as you mentioned, it cuts down the efficiency to 20%. Like why aren't our people keeping those clean. Maybe I don't understand the problem. I think because this is all about like stage lighting and room lighting and it really kind of reaches beyond the capabilities of say the directors and the faculty that are using those rooms. Well, right? Those those asking why aren't but why, why can't why our, why the why can't our maintenance people? The lights. Is, there so, know, is there something about it that we aren't capable of doing or is it just not done? I, I don't know. Okay, so that's one thing to look at. I, I mean, so we'll that would be that. an easy thing to do yeah. if we're capable of doing this. That's true. Uh, and the other question I had was, uh, we have started to talk about sound systems, and, and really just in the context of getting an estimate of, one, what work needs to be done, and two, what it might cost. Can you just summarize sort of where we are? Sure. We had somebody in and... We've actually spent quite a lot of time looking at this and talking about um, both Edison and Roosevelt. 
um, starting with the chairs. That's actually what started the conversation um, last year. And the initial thing we were looking at is to replace the chairs. Um, with those chairs are so old that there are no replacement parts, there are no replacement chairs. Um, we talked about moving pieces of the chairs and replacing sections of the, but that would look not nice at all. Um, to replace the seats in one auditorium is about $140,000. Um, so that's the problem we have with that. Um, then we moved into talking about sound and the initial estimate we got for improving this, the acoustics and the sound it was roughly $500,000 at each school. Um, so now what we have asked the architect to look at is to see if we can have a company that could come in that could kind of give us incremental choices um, because we didn't, we talked about a possibility of adding, and I'm probably using the wrong terminology because it's not my area of expertise, but uh, back speakers or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So, but we don't want to spend money doing something like that if it's an acoustical problem and not a speaker problem. So we really need an expert to come in and tell us, you know, if you spend $50,000, this is what you will get out of it. Um, so we are looking, our architect is looking at that, and it's a discussion we're going to have next week in facilities. Um, so we have, and we will continue the discussion. The, the issue that we do have is that it, you're correct. We're now looking at large sums of money um, that we are competing with boilers and things like right. that that, you know, I, I, I guess one of the other concerns I do have is I think maintenance, basic maintenance of the equipped sound mm -hmm. and lighting equipment has fallen off in these spaces. And that obviously brings these large sums in place, but if we can at least maintain what we do have. Right. Like we have that lovely new lighting board. I'm sure that there's some maintenance that must go along with that. Mm -hmm. It's much cheaper to maintain that new equipment. Or if that lighting board at Roosevelt needs to be cleaned out, it needs to be maintained. I don't know if it's every six months. I'm not an expert. But it's like maintaining things in your own house. And so if we can clean and maintain what we have, and it really is not just an issue at Roosevelt and Edison. We have similar problems at Westfield High School. If you look at the apron, I, I, I think it's, I hate to say this, it's sort of embarrassing that the front of our stage looks like that. That is like our jewel. So, right. Dana, so Dana, um, is this an area that could be a referendum? Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is we put a referendum out for our sports facilities mm -hmm. a couple years ago, um, unsuccessfully, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, but, but in my view, this is equally as important. Mm -hmm. Um, as someone who has been on that stage and danced with Rich, I won't describe how many times, but... Um, there a video? But, uh, there are but videos videos are available. Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, clearly, amen. I uh, hear you 100%, and, and, and it's not just a Roosevelt issue, it's certainly a high school and Edison issue, and even some of the elementary schools. Um, but it is something that potentially could be a referendum for the arts, so to speak. Absolutely. A and second question. Do it as either yeah. A second question. Or so you, well, no, it could no, be a referendum, referendum or a referendum. second. I would think this would be more of a refer referendum because of the, the dollar yeah. amounts. Because it's a big number, I mean, to, to accomplish and everything. And the type of work that and it is. the type of work, because those chairs right. got to get out of there. Because you do have a useful <laughs> life of yeah. 20, 30 years. I have a question, not for the $500,000 items, mm -hmm. but for some of the somewhat smaller items. Is, does it come out of all facilities or capital projects, or does it come out of any of the school budgets, or does it come out of fine arts budget? Where, well, that's where's the, part of where the are the buckets coming that's from? That's part of the problem, I think, right now, is that it's falling probably. If who is responsible? Um, I, I got your email on Thursday, I guess it was, or whoever, whoever's email it was. Um, but that was the first I heard of the high school issues. So. Then I followed up with Mr. Renwick to say, do you know anything about these? Because I didn't get budget requests for any of this. Is this included in your budget? He also was unaware of these issues. Um, first, I went to actually Linda King, and Linda King said, no, that wouldn't be me. That would be Peter. Um, so I think that's part of what we need to kind of... I don't think it has. I don't think those spaces have a true home. Get, get a handle on who's responsible. Right. And that's probably also why the maintenance is falling mm -hmm. right. through the cracks, because somebody has to ask for it to be maintained or, you know, 
So that, that's my guess. I don't. I don't really I know. I don't think that that's true. true. I think true. they don't have a home, and they don't have somebody in the district who, because so many people touch that. You've got tech people. Mm -hmm. You've got people on stage. You've got people who work in the front. You have so many different mm -hmm. um, specialties, and you have people who get contracted to come in and work in those spaces as well. Right. So. Who is the owner and the master of those domains? Especially when you have the high school who does contact out to many other places. Mm -hmm. And you know, you wonder if our facilities were better, we could potentially rent them out more. And, and the other piece, I agree with all that, the other piece is, and they're used so much. When you think of, I mean, you think of the weekends, for example, uh, in the high school, mm -hmm. for you have to schedule this concert and then that concert and this one and that one because there's so many groups who are performing there. Um, and that makes it difficult as well. You're absolutely right. And I guess if, if you were to consider a referendum, as a, per, as a resident of Westfield, I personally feel if you just positioned it as an arts thing versus a community, that those spaces serve the, truly the community, right? Because people come in and speak there too. The PTO holds meetings where people come in. I go to back to school nights. Those are community spaces. If it was just positioned only as an arts thing, I'm not sure that you would get the same support as these are community spaces, which they truly are. Good where point. else do you go in mm -hmm. our community where we gather as a group? Whether you have school kids in the school district or not. I uh, just want to thank you, Amy, for coming down tonight, and Therese and the other moms that came down. Um, you know, I just want to go back to my announcement, which right, was that we are you. having 40 musical events at approximately 2,500 students. So that means 5,000 parents yeah. are going to go through these spaces. I mean, obviously, some are at the kindergarten at Lincoln and whatnot. But, I mean, the community is in there all the time. That's where administrators mm -hmm. address our parents. That's where yep. the symphony plays. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's a community uh, space, as Amy was saying. And I do think that we should really put a little bit of focus on them, because I don't think over the last few years that there has been a focus on those spaces. Maybe the town would want to help a little, too. <laughs> um, so I think I that... They're part uh, of the community. I think to start... Some, I guess, to start, you guys will look at possibly what buckets it should be coming out of, the more of the, the maintenance issues, and, you know, talk to people about who's going to own it. And it could be shared ownership, because it is a shared space, but... Um, yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank, yes. you. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you for coming. All right. Any other presentations? Where is the superintendent? Um, I'll be talking again at policies, but not till then. All right. Well, that's not true. Then I would ask the board to approve, <laughs> approve the minutes of the board meeting held on February 11, 2014, February 18, 2014, yeah. and the private minutes of the February 11, 2014, and February 18, 2014 meetings. Do you have a second? Second. Second. Roseanne, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Personnel, Mark. <coughs> uh, I ask the board to consider personnel motions numbers 1 through 19. Um, retirements? Can I have a second? Oh, second? I'll second. Thanks. Uh, retirements? Yes, we do. You're right. We have two retirements tonight. Um, the first one is George Armstrong, who has been a steady, reliable lunch aide at Franklin School since uh, the year 2000. <coughs> and he has said that being with the wonderful students at Franklin has kept him, him young for those last uh, 13 or uh, 14 years. <laughs> Second retirement is Jeannie Jensen. She has been the nurse at Tamaqua School for the last 24 years, providing health services and instruction in healthy living to children. She's been a resource for parents and teachers, providing guidance and support in addressing health and safety issues. She will be missed, and we wish both of these staff members well in their retirements. Thank you. Any uh, other questions on personnel? Nope. Dana? Coach yep. Matesic? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Gallion? Yes. Roseanne Kerstad? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes.
Anything else, Mark? No, sir. All right, on facilities, just uh, again to reiterate, we will be having a review of the facilities projects, not only uh, the next two years out of the five-year plan, but also the security um, and the uh, particular conversation about rock <coughs> and prioritizing, and that's in two weeks? Yes, uh, th uh, three weeks. Three weeks, okay. um, I also want to say we opened bids for the roof projects for the upcoming okay. summer. Um, we, we bid those in four separate contracts. Um, we are still analyzing them, so I can't tell you who the low bidders are at this point and, and what the cost is, uh, but all of the bids were well within our budget, and um, we had quite a number of bidders, which was good. So we'll have some information probably not by next week, but probably by the 25th we'll be awarding contracts for those. Great. Dana, do, can I ask a facilities question real quick? Are we still stalled on the Jefferson Field because of the bids? We are. Well, yes, we're waiting. The town is supposed to be doing that now next October because um, October is the time frame that the field's not in use. They, right. they want to do it. Um, so there's, they have to go out to bid again, um, and if they get bids that will be okay. fit within their budget, they'll be doing it in October. So we just kind of have our portion earmarked yes. and waiting? Yes, correct. Okay. October 2015 now? 14. Or 14. 14. No, you 14. said next October. October. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> October of 2000. Gotcha. I forgot what month we were in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Long range planning. Uh, Dr. Dolan gave you a report of the um, content of our last meeting when she talked about enrollment impact on the budget. <laughs> Took your report away, Andrew. Mm -hmm. that one. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Uh, policy discretion? Um, we are, one of the things not on the agenda is to talk about um, revising this year's calendar due to the snow day. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dolan to make that presentation. Thank you. And I think um, Dana even has some calendars for us to. Oh, there it is. It's already up. Hang on. All right, so as everyone knows, this has been a challenging winter for everyone, not just schools, but certainly schools are, uh, are included in that. What, uh, we're fortunate in a way because um, working with both the policy committee and the board, we have always put um, days for snow days in our calendar. Um, so we are actually in, um, in pretty good shape. Let me start with the easy part of this, and that is um, our students in kindergarten through eighth grade. Okay, so with pushing back the last day of our school year for kindergarten through eighth graders to Friday, June 20th, those students now have 180 days. And that's what's required by the state, that they would have 180 days. So by pushing back the last day of school to Friday, June 20th, our K-8 to students have their 180 days and they're in good shape. Now, in order to discuss the next part, I'm going to use a few, um, a few <coughs> slides because it's a, just a little more complicated. The high school. The high school grades 9 through 12. Um, so I just told you that June 20th is the 180th day of the school year. That would mean that June 19th would be the 179th day of the school year. Right. June 19th is our high school graduation. The state is very specific. And the state um, says that before a student can graduate, they have to have 180 days, right? Um, we know that once you set the graduation, a lot of families plan around that in a lot of ways. So we really don't like moving the graduation. So we need another day before we get to June 19th. So what do you do? You look at the calendar. So let's look at the calendar. So if you look at March, our students go to school every Monday through Friday throughout the month of March. There are no open days. There, so there are no open days if you just focus on Monday through Friday. Let's go to April. All right, in April we have a spring break. The difficulty with this, you could always have students and staff go back in spring break. However, spring break includes both the first and second night of Passover as well as other nights, but it also includes uh, the end of the week is Holy Week uh, for other students. It's rather hard to find a day in there um, that would work, and the concern is both with those with religious holidays there, never mind that there are so few weeks in the year where families can plan to do anything whether that is just you know, visiting grandma or whether it is going on a trip, 
we are really concerned if we were to add a day for the high school in that week that we're not going to have enough students or staff there to make it a worthwhile day. That's a real concern. We're afraid it's not going to be a worthwhile day. So we didn't really like that option. And if you look other than that, what we have are weekends there. Let's go to May. In May, the only day we have available is Memorial Day, uh, a day that is important on a number of different aspects. Um, um, so that's the only day that would have been available. And if you go to June, if you go to June, again, your option would be to move graduation back. You would have to move it to the next week. You couldn't move it to a Friday night, and that does disrupt a lot of students who already have plans, uh, families who already have plans. So we've um, spoken with the high school quite a bit as to what we're going to do. And after quite a bit of discussion, we want a day that will be worthwhile where we will have a good number of staff and a good number of students who were there. Um, so we started looking at Saturdays. Now parents who live in not only this town, but we'll focus on this town, you know how busy Saturdays are because every Saturday is something. So we tried to check as many things as we could. We checked things like SATs. We checked major community events that involve, you know, we know 100 students are going to be confirmed on this day. We know that this many students are going away on this weekend. We tried to check as many as possible. But I am here to tell you there's not one weekend where students aren't doing something in this town. All right, so, but we tried anyway. We, we found one that doesn't have as many as the other days. So there we are. If you look at April, the first Saturday in April is April 5th. And I'm sure somebody's busy, I'm sure. <laughs> However, it seems to be fewer people are busy on Saturday, April 5th. And what um, I am recommending is that that day, Westfield High School has a four-hour day, a regular four-hour session. Um, and with that, the students will come in for the four hours. Teachers will be there for the four hours. They th can then go off and have their afternoons and evenings and the rest of the weekend. And with that, we do not have to move graduation. Graduation will still be on the 19th, and uh, everyone will have completed the 180 days. That being said, we all have to just hope the weather gods are continue to be happy and don't have another storm. So the recommendation for K to 8 is already on the calendar, moving everyone to June 20th. The recommendation for 9th to 12th grade is to open school on one Saturday, the first Saturday in April, um, in order to have the uh, requisite days. And the last day of school for grades 9 through 12. Thank you. And the last day of school for grades 9 through 12 would then be on the 19th. All right, that would be, that would then be their 180th day. And they would be staying home on, on June 20th. Which will surely make little brother and sister I read. Mm -hmm. Yes, clearly. <laughs> so as a matter of fact, and that's spelled out on the next slide, the June slide. So if you can see on the 19th, it is the last day of students for grades 9 to 12, and graduation is that night. And then the 20th is the last day for students for K to 8. Well done. Thank you. Not an easy decision. <laughs> so I have some questions. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, so I noticed that the day you chose is this um, youth and uh, youth youth government. government day. Right. Do they go in the afternoon? Do they go in the morning? Are they away for the weekend? And is this Hershey? No. This is no. Hershey. This is. No. Uh, no. Is this Trenton? Trenton. Yes. Yeah. This is Trenton. Uh, but that that is a school related event, so they will sure. be able to go, and that will count for their day. They would be away anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there were other days. There were other Saturdays. There were. And so I'm just wondering what your thinking was in discarding them. There were a couple in, I understand the Saturday before a vacation starts, the Saturday after a vacation. Right. Yeah. We wanted to give, in, first let me just start, we wanted to give enough uh, advance notice okay. to parents. We didn't want to just say it'll be, you know, this Saturday, for example. We didn't okay. think that was fair. So that pushed it back. Um, we try, again, we, what we tried to look for in, uh, was what are some big events that we know our high school students are involved. So for example, on April 26th, we were looking at that date. We thought yeah. that would be a good date. And then we found out that 100 students in grade 10 are gonna be confirmed that day. Well, that's a large number. You know, we can't account for everyone, but that is a large number. Um, and uh, we looked at other days, again, SAT we looked at. Yeah. Um, 
Um, ACT. Yeah, yeah, yes, we tried to look at as many yeah. as possible. I am sure there are some students who are still scheduled to do things. We also looked at some of the major sporting event days. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly looked at the plays when the plays were. Um, plays were pretty much done in time, luckily, but um, we looked for those as well. And the May dates, those are weekends for studying for exams? And yes. Like. Yeah, we thought that in May, our, especially our students who are taking APs, for right. example, they really are busy enough um, right. trying to prepare themselves. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these are busy students we have. I just want to say that. I knew it before, but trying to go through the schedule rather uh, reinforce that. I think that this is not an easy decision, but I mean, it wasn't easy to work out, but I think that this is a uh, works for me. Yep. A working plan. Yep. If, of course, we don't have another. So, right. Okay. I did look out for the next 10 days. We're not supposed to have another, but I can't promise more than that. So um, I'll make a motion that we uh, change the 2013-14 calendar to reflect. And I will second. Saturday. Dana. Any other conversation? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Do we want to talk about more? Do we have to vote? Yes. Or no? Yes. It's a policy. Yes. Lucy, Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? No. Brendan Gilligan? Yes. Roseanne Kerstad? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olig? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. All right. And we will work on getting communication out as soon as possible. Can, to say, can we get that posted tomorrow? <laughs> yes. Yes, <laughs> we certainly can. Right away. Yeah. Yes, we certainly can. Um, I would like to ask the board to consider policy motion number two uh, to approve for first reading the abolishment, is that a word, of the following policies, uh, 3220 evaluation of teaching staff members and 3222 evaluation of tenured teaching staff members. Can I have a second? Second. Um, Y'all will remember that we recently adopted a new policy uh, about uh, evaluation, and so in adopting about evaluating our teachers based on the Marshall Plan. So now that that is our new policy, we no longer have a need for these two policies. Any questions or conversation? Okay, Dana. Rich Matesic. Dana. Rich Matesic. Yes. Dan Carey. Yes. Mark Friedman. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kirsted. Yes on 14HSO3, and I'm going to abstain on 14RO3. Are you refusing or abstaining? Oh, I'm refusing. Thank you. On 14RO3? 14 14RO3? 14 yeah. Yes. Okay. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Anything else to pause? No, that's it. Thank you. That's it. Curriculum, instruction, and programs. For example. Yes, I'd like the board to approve for first reading the following curricula. Social studies, grade five, world language, French three, French three. Uh, well, world language and mathematics as listed below. There you go. May I have a second? Second. second. <laughs> <laughs> um, while there are quite a few curricula, as you can see, most, well, all of them really, were revised to reflect the Common Core State Standards. Um, in addition, however, the world language is also up within its five year, within the five year renew cycle. And in line with what uh, that department is doing, um, with organizing their curriculum based not only on the Common Core standards, but on the, the world language standards with the modes of language of interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational, these curricula now affect, uh, reflect that organization. Um, <coughs> would people like me to go over the individual curricula? <coughs> I would like the board to hear from the director of the department eventually so that we understand what the concept is for this new curricular content conversation or the new evaluation or the new objective setting. For which one? Jim? For Mr. Greer. Mr. Greer. For yeah. world languages? Well, the world languages, ha it, it, it is a, a slightly different um, he, uh, there, there's, a, there's a different process that he's using or, or evaluation or structure of the, of the objectives that's being embedded within the content. 
I think it's a very it would interesting be great conversation for him to come in. I recall him coming in when he first when we when he first began doing this revision, but I could be wrong. How but many? He, how should, many remember it? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if yeah. I remember from curriculum or from well, I'm the same. Meeting. I don't know so. if it's, it was so, a city yeah, meeting. Yeah, I think or not. that would be yeah. a great idea. Yeah. But, I, so, I, but yeah. I, I would also, to respect his time, an email I think would suffice, right? Oh, that's no, really not what I pretty, had in mind. I think what I had in mind was, was a conversation so that he has exposure <laughs> in the management of his area as well as we have the information and the public gets the information. This, this is a, a huge change and it's a broad area of um, courses that we've been approving lately. So that's my thought. I mean, I, I always love hearing about curriculum, so I'm not going to be against this. Uh, we can certainly see... Well, I definitely we, think he should come in. I think that's a great that, idea. I, I'm not be sure. Now. I, right. I'm not sure how great the change is in the actual instruction. I think no, the change is be. more in the organization. And there are, they are doing some very interesting things at the department level that I think everybody should hear about, for sure, with um, meeting together and working on consistency within buildings and then in the high school among the various courses and developing rubrics um, that are used throughout the courses. So well, I think clearly we don't, I don't have the language to discuss it, so <laughs> I am at a loss. So, to ask for what I want, but what I want is for him to come and talk to us. Right, and that's my We can still vote tonight, though, right? On sure. This? Oh, on the first reading, yeah. Yeah. So do Good. people want me to go through each individual curriculum? No, no thank you. I don't think okay. you need to. Does you anybody... Give them to us. Right. right, okay. Um, so that's world languages, and then the math... <laughs> can I, you want me to turn it um, Twice. Again, these Should were practice? specifically revised for, um, to be in line with the Common Core state standards, um, and in that revision, I, I hopefully you remember that K-5 has already been revised to meet uh, the Common Core state standards, 6, 7, 8 was already revised to be Common Core state standard, the 9th and 10th curriculum have all been um, already revised, so these are the last math curricula that need to be revised to be in line with the Common Core State Standards, and they are the math courses that 11th and 12th, that are offered to the 11th and 12th graders. Um, within that alignment of the Common Core State Standards, um, the, the largest shifting of content was in the pre-calculus, pre-calculus AP and pre-calculus honors tracked, let's just say. Um, and that is completely because of the expectations as delineated within the Common Core State Standards. So some things <clears throat> kids are being taught earlier before pre-calculus. Um, so it's been pushed down into, um, it's been pushed down to the algebra geometry pieces and so that Things then that were put in calculus have been pushed down to pre-calculus, so they did um, a lot of reorganizing of that um, in the document. And the other pieces, the content areas, remained somewhat the same. Uh, there was a change, a record. There is a recommended change for calculus, which is now called Fundamentals of Calculus, and the department believes that that does not give the course the credit that it deserves because it is a full calculus course. Fundamentals in, in front of the name sort of implies that it's just low level and basic, and it's really not. It is a calculus class. So um, they are recommending to change that name to calculus. Um, and then the computer science class, they would like to change that name as well. Computer science one is currently called computer science basic, visual basic, which is a specific programming language. Um, and they believe that there are lots of programming languages out there and to limit computer science, the first introduction to um, programming to visual basic is limiting. Um, kids' options and opportunities, and teachers' options and opportunities. So they would like to um, take that visual basics off of 
the computer science name. And lastly, just to give you some information about discussion on computer science, the curriculum committee talked quite a bit with um, Dr. Kicek, the head of math, the supervisor of math, about the possibility of offering some additional math electives but that are available to ninth and 10th graders. Because right now, the math electives that are available are available at the higher end. So um, that would include, um, potentially, this is just we were talking about these kinds of things, um, application design, programming of web design. I think it's HTML. I don't know if that's still in or not. But um, so there's some talk of, of looking at that, of a way to um, beef up the, those types of electives in the math department. So are there any other, are there any questions? Just a note that uh, computer science too is an AP course. Yes. But three is not. Right, three is an honor, yes. <laughs> and that's the way it works out. And you take the AP course before the honors course. The honors course is above the AP course. So that's not spelled out here? No. That's not written here correctly. Right. Right. So it should be Computer Science 1, Computer Science 2 AP, and Computer Science 3 Honors. Thank you. Yeah. So I would also suggest that sometime in the near future, Dr. Kicek, come and talk to us about the math curriculum as it's being sure. fleshed out. It seems to be evolving um, yeah. nicely. And I think we would benefit from that conversation. I would benefit from the conversation. We all would. Yeah. No, it's good. I mean, yeah, she has, they're clearly she, focused on STEM issues and expanding the, the computer science, you know, curriculum. I, uh, yeah, I think it would be good for everybody. Especially now that we're through the whole wave of revisions. Right, and talking about the plan and the, the sequencing. Yeah. Okay. Can we vote? Rich Matessa. Yes. Ann Carey. Yes. Mark Friedman. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kirstead. Yes. Ginny Lights. Yes. Gretchen Olick. Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. Overnight trip. I would like to ask the board to approve the following district field trips and overnight field trips as per attached. May I have a second? Second. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Rich Matesic. Yes. Ann Carey. Yes. Mark Friedman. Yes. Brendan Galligan. Yes. Roseanne Kerstead. Yes. Mm. Ginny Lights. Okay. Gretchen Olick. Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. Yes, um, and also under curriculum, I believe Mr. Pinero, mm -hmm. our assisting superintendent, is going to speak just a little bit about some of the um, student performance data. <laughs> you can still stand. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Good evening. I know it's been a, um, well, yeah. We have a lot of long nights, so, so I, I, it is it is a brief report, and I can't resist because I got pretty excited listening to the tech stuff to just say um, that if you went into one of our BYOD or Google Apps classroom pilots tomorrow, you might see a teacher um, use a poll everywhere, meaning she would ask a question yes, uh, you know, about an opinion on let's say what's going on in Ukraine, and no matter what device a student had they could pull it out and they could respond. The teacher could walk around with her tablet. She could jot down, uh, well, she could first project what the responses were and everybody could see it from their classrooms. And then she would be able to walk around with her tablet and scribble out an essential question like when should any nations intervene in issues in foreign lands, let's say. Um, that would be an essential question. And then students could, uh, she might instruct them, go into groups, use your devices, create a document and start looking stuff up. What are your opinions about this subject? And they would pull it together. One group might have uh, a table from a regular document. Somebody might decide to use a spreadsheet. Someone might use some kind of graphic illustration. Um, walking around, the teacher could tap a button and one group's 
collection of information would pop on the screen. They talk about that. I guess what I'm just saying is those are the kinds of things you would see, you might see tomorrow in some of our classrooms. And um, as we move forward and uh, keep equipping the classrooms with the kind of things that uh, Mr. Ocker was talking about, and uh, you know that does take time. And I don't know that everybody would be ready to do that tomorrow anyway. But I got excited and I wanted to share. Like I started thinking, well, what would I do tomorrow if I had that technology? And I would do something like that, I think. Anyway, so thanks for indulging me. I apologize. Um, so anyway, this is shorts. I just wanted to take a few moments to report that we have received the last of the student performance information that the Department of Education releases annually. And I'm proud to say that our students continue to do very well in standard assessments. As I reported in the fall, the students of Westfield consistently perform very well above state averages, very well above state averages uh, on New Jersey's assessments and at or typically above the performance of socioeconomic peers. This is also true of the College Board's advanced placement and SAT assessments. And even further, Westfield significantly outperforms students nationally and globally when comparing them uh, to students who take these tests around the world. In fact, uh, just a little earlier today, we received a tweet, um, a Westfield tweet, about the recent SAT and ACT results and how Westfield has chalked up 19 perfect scores. And in effect, we got a verbal retweet from Mitch Slater when he did the announcement about the 19 perfect <laughs> scores. So um, a verbal retweet, that's kind of fun. Um, so uh, what I thought I'd do, because you, you did see the presentation in the fall, and we did explore in depth, really, um, the comparative nature, you know, the comparative performance of our students versus socioeconomic peers. And um, that presentation is still on the website if you'd like to look at it. Um, and so when all of the data is in, now that we have it all in, we've pulled out some highlights uh, to share with you tonight. For example, all 10 Westfield public schools met student growth indicator targets which includes student growth on uh, English language arts and math assessments. All 10 schools met those growth tar indicator targets. Um, also, 97% of uh, Westfield High School students taking the HESPA language arts literacy assessment scored in the advanced proficient or and proficient categories. Uh, so that's combined of the amount, uh, 44 of that amount, 44% were advanced proficient in language arts. Um, in math, 94% of Westfield High School students taking the math HESPA, that's the uh, high school proficiency assessment, scored in advanced proficient and proficient categories. And of that total, 56% earned advanced proficient ratings. 56% of the students advanced proficient in math, 94% total proficient. Uh, next one is 95% of Westfield High School students taking AP uh, advanced placement tests scored three or higher. So, uh, what was it? 95%, three or higher. Let me double check that. On uh, the advanced placement tests. A um, couple more. Westfield High School students averaged a composite score uh, on the SAT of 1742. So, that's uh, our students averaged a composite score of uh, 1742 on the SAT, surpassing the peer average by 59 points and the state average by 230 points, uh, and the national average by 244 points. So, and, and by the way, that, if you're doing the math quickly, you know, uh, New Jersey does, uh, the state average is higher than mm -hmm. the national average. So good for New Jersey, you get the plug in for New Jersey, but even much better for Westfield. Our students continue to do really well on the SATs. Um, another one, when compared to schools across the state, Westfield High Schools, academic performance ranked high, graduation and post-secondary performance ranked high, and college and career readiness very high on the performance reports. And last one I have for you tonight, although there are many more highlights if, if you dig through the data further, uh, Westfield High School has met 100% of all targets as defined by the New Jersey Department of Education's NCLBE waiver performance report. Um, so the high school has met all of its targets and these include academic achievement, college and career readiness, and graduation in post-secondary areas. So uh, those are some pretty impressive accomplishments. <coughs> Our students are doing very well. All, of course, a uh, big part of their, of course, all a uh, big part of their successes come from the support, encouragement, and guidance that they receive at home from their parents, in classrooms with their teachers, and the community from their neighbors, and here at the table from our Westfield Board of Education. 
So um, those are just a few of the highlights I wanted to share with you. Uh, again, it reinforces what we looked over in uh, the test data that we received in the fall. And um, thanks for having me over here. And if you have any questions on the data that I shared with you. Mm -hmm. Paul, do we continue? Did, did the data arrive with um, cohort comparisons again? They still, yes. So the reports, the performance reports, each school comes with its own um, individualized peer, uh, peer group. Yeah, whatever right. they're called, peer Right. Groups. So there's 30 in a group. Yeah. So uh, they provide who's in the group, and that's who the uh, peer group is for that school report. And did, was there any change in positioning within peer group, or, or it was yeah. retained from the original data? Um, you mean from year to year for school? Like, I don't know. Is this yeah. the same year? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no. All right. So in. this is a new performance report year. Oh. So you, you very well may wind up in a, uh, I'm sure of it, um, in a group of 30 that's not exactly what you had last year because of the formula that they use. Right. Right. The groups change from year to year. Yeah. Next. And they're not consistent in the district either. So like... Every school has its, its individual groups of peers. Right. I understand that. Right. So were, were you pleased? Were you displeased? Were you surprised? Were you what? Yeah. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Sure. Well, um, as we talked about a little bit last year, the, the data, point. when we pull it out, right, presents the kind of um, results that we talked about today. Uh, as far as the way the performance report conveys that with the peer groups, it's not necessarily based on the number, it's in the percentile rankings. And as we talked about, um, my classic example is that last year, the high school scored 97% proficient in the HESPA and their, perform and their peer percentile was 45%. So or their percent they were in the 45th percentile. So um, I don't, you know, so that that's not as important to us when we look at the student's performance okay. as the scores that they received and how that compares to uh, scores, not the percentiles. The, the, you know, um, the percentile approach isn't quite as accurate as comparing test scores to peers, which we continue to do. Yes. Are the peer groups the same from last year for each school, or do they shuffle them up? Yeah, they now, shuffle them up. yeah, they, they, it, it's based on a formula that has something to do with. Um, percentages of free and reduced lunch and maybe some other indicators um, that they can they consider indicators of socioeconomic so there's yeah. no consistency from year to year so you can't say we're doing better in our peer group when the peer group keeps changing <laughs> right exactly. that's right. right and again you know again that classic example and I saw this you know in one that I broke down it takes about four or five hours to actually look up everyone else's date and plug it in and um, so a couple of things that jumped out is that last year's was 16 schools, uh, high schools had the 97% passing. And when you do percentile, because we, we pushed, we wanted some answers. When you do percentile, the literal trans um, definition of that is, um, uh, what is it? Uh, everybody, you're, the percent is everybody below you. So it ignores the fact that there might be 16 with you. It's everybody below you. Right. So if you have 97% and so do 16 others, you're at the bottom automatically because the definition of percentile is how many people are below you. Um, so that was one thing. Another thing, uh, when we looked at, so elementary school, um, is it college and career readiness with attendance? So yes. the one indicator for college and career readiness is attendance. Um, so you could imagine in, in districts that have the, the benefit of high attendance, they're all clumped up. So Franklin School was one that I broke down on one of the snow days. It takes a long time to look everybody else's data up. And, um, it, you know, Franklin's percentile rank was strong, but they were ranked some kind of three. And they don't give you really the formula necessarily for that, you know, absentee figure. But at any rate, there was three. And then there were a few in there that couldn't possibly have been right. Um, it suggested that nobody showed up for like 100 days in one school. I can imagine what that <laughs> board, board, you know, what that board meeting looked like. And, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, we like to look at the specific numbers because those percentile ranks are really in question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you pull the data that. Yeah, we pull it. And, right. Meaningful. Correct. And to help us. Mm -hmm. be better yeah in fact um, what you saw in the fall is what we uh, continue to do and, and drill down more and more with 
um, within the schools, within all teachers. In fact, um, I was able to put together that data that you understandably have been waiting for, and I appreciate your patience. And what that was from was New Jersey Smart specific numbers, and it showed us. See, that's useful. That's we better. now have information as to uh, who participated in a program, one of our programs um, for academic support, and who didn't. And the, uh, you know, the, the typical and high growth percentages of that. And we can do that in each area and then evaluate the effectiveness of a program. Now, if you plug in the percentile rank somehow associated with that, it would be useless. Um, but in that regard, we can pull the data. We're getting it, we're getting uh, incredibly, we're getting increasingly, I guess I could say incredibly in some areas, but we're getting increasingly uh, adept at playing with those numbers. It's kind of fun. Um, and uh, I think you're seeing that, especially in the areas that we really need it the most. Um, and so like that. So when, when we take the data and, and use it in that manner, it's very useful. The percentile ranks just don't really provide the kind of overview we need. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Paul. Nope. Oh, hang on. It's Mark. Like the board to consider finance motions numbers one through ten. Uh, number ten, call out a uh, the board would like to accept a gift from, from the Westfield Coalition for the Arts for uh, three thousand eight hundred and fifty nine dollars to the Westfield High School Music Department for the purchase of a new choral riser. So thank you for that. I have a second. A second. question? No Ooh. question. Second. No, I have a second. Second. Ginny, question? Okay, Dana. Rich Matessa? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Roseanne Kirsten? Yes. Ginny Light? Yes. Gretchen Oli? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Well, actually, I do have a question. Dana, mm -hmm. it's on the um, number four, the out of district placements. Too late. Could you? No, it's not a question on the data and whether I vote on it. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually a question on uh, the percentage of usage of our um, tuition line and how we're doing. It's, it's um, what are, where are we? Uh, for this eight, seven months into the budget year? We're using, we have. So could you, could you just draw together something for the board? Maybe put it in the notes Friday? Just to show what how much there's been so far compared to yeah. what our budget is. Yeah. We've had a number of um, arrivals in the district with tuition assessments that have come to us. Mm -hmm. and, and given that the budget is can only be based on the actual cost of students in the district at the time that the budget is struck, mm -hmm. we, we can't project cost increases based on year over year. Uh, differences. Mm -hmm. So given that, it would be interesting for me to see uh, how our budget is uh, being managed. Sure. And just as an FYI, the um, Finance Committee does look at um, starting last month and for the rest of the, the year, they look at a uh, fund balance projection, which includes that line for out of district tuition um, specifically, but I can absolutely send that to you on Friday. Great. Are these uh, special ed out of district schools yes. limited to the same two percent budget no. increases they are not so they could they go up ten percent next year and we have and no control correct. over it that's correct they have no limit at all it makes it even more fun to budget and as a matter of fact they can come back to us three years later and tell us they undercharged us <laughs> um, and send us bills because their actual costs were higher than what they anticipated can we get a P.O. box out in the Cayman Islands or something they can send those bills to? <laughs> Mark, anything else? No, sir. Legislation? Uh, no report tonight. Uh, Technology Committee, Mitch? No, we're good. No, I'd ask the board to note the notes for the record and uh, ask whether there's any unfinished business. Any new business? Any liaison reports? I would then ask, I uh, would then recognize the public for any questions or comments on any topic. Seeing no one come to the podium, uh, I would ask the board to approve the following resolutions. Resolved that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, personnel pending or anticipated litigation and pending or anticipated contract negotiations, 
and be it further resolved that any discussion held by the board which need not remain confidential and the results of the discussions will be made public as soon as practicable. Can I have a second? Ginny, thank you. Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstain? Any opposed? We are adjourned.